She want me to do the party. That's what I'm concerned oh. about. <laughs> Good morning. The Committee on Parole is called to order. Today's date is um, to one well, yeah. November 15th. The uh, time is 8.35. Uh, the panel today will be Mr. Alvin Roche, uh, Ms. Pearl Wise. My name is Tony Marabella. I'll be chairing the, com uh, the committee today. I'm going to ask the staff here at DOC headquarters in Baton Rouge to introduce themselves. Whitney Trasclair. Sherelle. Pearl Williams. Captain Terry Brown. Thank you very much. Uh, our remote location this morning is at Raymond Board. With the staff there, please introduce themselves. Good morning, Mr. Marabella, Mr. Roche, Ms. Wise, or Marcus mm -hmm. Myers. Raven Heath classification. Joshua Thank you. Uh, we're ready for our first case. Our first case is going to be Mr. Carson Odom. Mr. Odom, would you give us your full name and DOC number? My name is Carson Odom, DOC number 302-735. Mr. Odom, let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information in the record. Then we're going to conduct a parole interview with you. Uh, then we're going to ask Warden Myers to give us some input uh, as to how you're doing, where you are. <clears throat> then uh, you have some people here today. Uh, none of them wish to speak, but I do want to, uh, for the record, uh, give their names. Uh, in support of you today is Miss Brenda Johnson, who is your aunt, and Larry Johnson, who is your uncle. Uh, also uh, here today uh, by Zoom, but not speaking, uh, in opposition is uh, Miss Charity Netherland, Miss Courtney Netherland, and Miss Robin Netherland. Uh, once we have the hearing, you'll have an opportunity to say whatever it is you'd like to say to the board, and then we'll vote. You understand our process? This is the matter of Carson R. Odom, DOC number. 302735, date of birth, August the 17th of 1973. He's a seventh class of felony offender. He has a, a parole eligibility date. Well, I don't know if that's correct. But, but anyway, he's got adjusted good time date of September the 13th of 2043, full term date of June the 20th of 2046. He is currently serving a 43 year sentence on the charges of uh, attempted second degree murder and uh, Contraband, uh, conspiracy to commit contraband. Is that information accurate, uh, Mr. Odom? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mr. Odom, your case has been assigned to me, so I'll begin our interview process. Uh, Mr. Odom, how old are you, sir? 50 years old. And how long have you been in prison on these charges this time? 20 years, sir. I'm sorry? 20 years. 20 Tell me a little bit about your educational background. Uh, I completed my high set uh, in 2019. Uh, since then, I've taken computer literacy courses. I've taken some uh, communication courses through the mail and uh, pretty much continued that, my education through the system here. That's uh, let's talk a little bit about... Uh, the crime that was committed uh, here in 2003. I'd like to talk a little bit about who Carson Odom was then, okay? Uh, were you working at the time? What? What kind of work were you doing? Doing construction uh, for a company in Leesville with Mr. Uh, Charles Stuckey. Were drugs and alcohol uh, an issue with you? Yes, sir. Drugs, mo mostly drugs. I've Never yeah, been. Let's, let's talk a little bit about your drug use. When did you start using drugs? About 14, 15 years old. And what did you start using? Cocaine. Okay. How often would you use cocaine when you were 14, 15, 16 years old? Back then, it was probably just a couple of times a week. Yeah. <laughs> and did you progress from there to... More often? Well, I progressed from there to just about daily use. Okay. And how old were you about when you progressed to daily use? Okay. About 16, 17 years old. Now, you're a seventh offender. I, I show you got, uh, when you count all of your felony convictions, you've got approximately 12 felony convictions. Were all of these convictions having to do with uh, uh, drugs or involving drugs? Or were you on drugs at the time? <laughs> Every one of them. 
Did you ever have any treatment on the outside? Yes, sir. I went to a treatment center in Pineville. Uh, it was early 2000. Uh, and I, I went through AANA when I was in Allen Correction. You find, are you talking about Red River or where did you go? Red River and Gateway. Okay. Out in the adult center. Okay. And, uh, I went to AA and NA throughout my incarceration, uh, mostly in Allen. Since the pandemic, they haven't pretty much got us back online to where we were then, but I, I do go occasionally. How many times have you actually gone to prison? Oh, uh, sir, I, I would say at least five. And when you went to prison on those times, did you have any classes or any treatment while you were in prison? No, oh, sir. None of my pre previous incarcerations, none at all. Uh, now, did you follow at any time after getting out of uh, Pineville, the, the, the programs in Pineville? Did you follow uh, up with your AA meetings? Yes, sir. For a while, I went to Rainbow House, which is outpatient. But I, I was not uh, free very long. I, I ended up getting incarcerated not very long after that again. Now that you look back, now that you've been in prison for twenty years and you've taken a lot of programs, look back and tell me why it is you couldn't stay off drugs. Oh, I couldn't handle pressure very well back then when I was younger. Uh, I didn't have many family members or friends at all. Uh, whenever things would get hard, I would I would always run back to the drugs. It was never the people, places, or things because I never really hung around anyone too much. It kind of seemed that no matter where I went, I kind of gravitated toward doing the same things because that's the things that I went to look for. Let's talk a little bit about what you've done while you've been in prison to address your substance abuse problem. What sort of programs have you taken uh, for your substance abuse? Uh, like I said, I've attended AA and NA. Uh, I've completed living in balance phase one. Phase two should be completed next week. Uh, uh, thinking for a change, I've completed that, sir. Those are excellent educational courses. Have you taken anything that really is treatment? Uh, those are the only ones that are offered as far as what we're able to take beyond AA and NA. And that. Uh, those are the most extensive ones here. How do you think? How do you think things are different now as opposed to when you were last released uh, twenty plus years ago? Uh, uh, how do you think you'll be able to control uh, your sobriety now as opposed to back when you committed this crime? Sir, back then I still, I was still thinking with an adolescent mind. Uh, I've, didn't really have many responsibilities or concerns as far as bettering myself. It never really took anything seriously as far as whether it was prison or never thought too much about death. But as I've gotten older, I continuously thought about growing old and dying in prison and then seeing the effects that drugs have on people, people that were released from here and went home and died immediately, people that come back with a life sentence. And I don't want to be like that. I know that I have the potential and the will to do right. So tell me what your plan is to stay sober. Well, I plan to get involved with church. I have several members of the church community that offer to mentor me and help me in any way that I can. They're all here for me today, They're here for me on Zoom. They've offered to help me in any way as far as any type of treatment or be in there for me uh, daily if I need it. It's good to have a support group like that, but what is your plan? What is what is what do you think you need to stay sober? Uh, just the will to do it and the help of my family. I I, I no longer want to do drugs. I I have no desire to. I have no desire to come back like this and grow old. You know, Mr. Odom, uh, I, I hear you and I believe you as as you sit there. Uh, you know, and, and that's why I asked you about treatment, because I think treatment is extremely important because drug addiction isn't about choice or will. It's a disease. And you've got to have the right formula to be able to treat your disease. It's it's just not about will or choice. Uh, you know, I was I was a drug court judge for 14 years and I've seen time and time and time and time again, people get sober, they stay sober, and they think they've got it lit. 
Uh, but but the more treatment you get, the better chance that you'll have. And I, I really believe you need some long-term substance abuse treatment. Tell me what your thought is about that. Well, if that's recommended, I, I would gladly do it. I mean, if it's beneficial to me in my future, as far as me not having to return to this lifestyle, I, I'm more than willing to do whatever it takes. Can we both agree that you're a drug addict? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about what happened on June the 22nd, <laughs> 2003. Uh, did you know Mr. Netherland? Yeah, I did. Okay, so so tell, me, tell me how this happened. Walk me through that day and, 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 and walk me through what you did and, and why. Uh, Mr. Netherland, uh, I, I did work with him and for him uh, for quite a few months before it happened. That particular day, I used his truck to go get some parts and supplies. While I was gone, I ended up using drugs in his vehicle and stayed gone far longer than I told him I would. And when I came back to his house, uh, I think it was like, Later, the following way, the following evening, he was he was real upset. Understandably, he was he was very mad. I mean, all he'd ever done was try to help me. I mean, he's he talked to me a lot, helped me any kind of way as far as financially or work. He'd always make sure I have something to do. And but he was pretty mad that day, and I wasn't thinking clearly at all. And we were arguing. I mean, it just I don't even know how it happened. Like I say, he was upset. And, when he reached for me, I, I hit him with a baseball bat. And I, I can't say exactly how I did it or what, but I remember had him turning and looking at me while he was on the ground, kind of in recognition. And that's that's what snapped me back to. And I put him in the truck and I brought him to the hospital. And that, that was pretty much what happened, sir. You had the wherewithal to realize and, and to make up a story that you found him, that you didn't do this. I mean, you you pretty much knew what you were doing. After the fact, I was I was scared after I brought him to the hospital. All I could think about at that time and the selfishness was me. Everything was about me. I wasn't really thinking about him or, or particularly what I had done or how it affected me. And when the police got there, I, I lied to him and I told him that I did find him like that. What what programs have you taken or what uh, what have you done in the last uh, 20 years to sort of uh, come to grips with yourself as to what what horrible damage you caused to his family? Well, sir, one of the most important things I've taken is victim impact. In that class, I mean, out of everything I've taken, it's been the most profound and, and touching for me because it not only showed me what I did to him and his family, but what I did to my family and any other people that I've touched, their lives that I've touched because of my addiction and my action and things that I just took for granted. That was the class that meant most to me was Victim's Impact. But I also took Cage of Rage. So I've never been an angry person. Do I, I'm sure that I do have some suppressed problems, but... I did take Cage of Rage, and that showed me how to deal with a lot of feelings and as far as expressing myself in ways that, that doesn't lead to altercation or problem. Now, uh, you indicated that things are different now. You're older. You don't want to go back to that kind of a lifestyle. Can you pinpoint kind of when this turnaround or when the light went on, so to speak? Uh, a lot of times when I was in drug court, I could see it in people. Uh, the way the drug court worked is every week I would talk to the people in drug court. And sometimes they would just stare at me with blank eyes. And then after a while, they had a little spark in their eyes. And I could see that they had turned a corner or, or something was happening. With them. Do you know when that was for you? I'd say it was about 2019 specifically. Because Things were happening as far as uh, a lot of things in my life that weren't good and started reaching out to God and I started praying a lot. Though I've, I was raised in church, I've never really prayed a lot. I've never really sought him that much. But at about 2019, I started looking at things a whole lot differently because several of my friends had just gotten out of prison and died immediately. My sister's husband recently, he overdosed and died and left her with four kids. 
the youngest one, three years old. And I mean, it's just, I don't want that. I don't, I mean, I've, I've made people suffer enough, hurt everybody I've ever touched in my life. I would like a chance to do good, to make some, some sort of mark on the world to say that I was here, you know, that somewhere somebody will mourn for me if I do die. That's when I started thinking about that it was about 2019 and doing things from that point to change. Let, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, this contraband arrest. You were charged with a conspiracy to tell me what happened. Tell me how all that happened. I was in Allen Correctional and I had made a phone call to my family uh, and had them send money somewhere to my mother. And that was done, but I didn't know that the person that I was sending it to was a big drug dealer. I knew that he did have some drugs. But as it turned out, me being affiliated with him, I got the same write-up and charge that he did, which was introduction of contraband at the Allen Correction. Well, what were you writing to him for? You know, I, was, I was having money transferred to his account through the phone, and they recorded the phone conversation, and that's that's how I... So you're telling me you didn't realize what was going on? You just were no, I, I knew what was going on, and I knew why I was sending him the money, but I didn't know that he was that in in depth with what he was doing. You didn't know he was as big a drug dealer as he was. That's right. I didn't he know was drug dealer. I didn't know that. Let's talk a little bit about your your, your write ups. You had you had twenty three total write ups, but you had three in twenty twenty two. Two for aggravated disobedience and one for unauthorized area. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I think the first write-up that I had was in Angola. When I was transferred uh, last year, I had to go to physical therapy there. And I was placed in a situation. I was put in a dorm with people that I was having problems with before I left. And I asked to be moved out of that dorm, and they said, well, we just can't move you where you want to live at. So they told me that I would have to be written up on a Rule 5 uh, and – placed in the block. So I called my sister and she had talked to the uh, ranking officer and that's what they did. But uh, after I came back from Allen, back to, I mean, I'm sorry, back from Angola to Cottonport, I left from here with a strive card. I hadn't gotten a ride up in years and I was doing well, but I left from here with a strive card. When I came back, they didn't issue me one. I was up late at night and I get, got written up for being, being up without a strive card, though I did have one before I left. And what was the unauthorized area? That, that's the same thing for being in the television room without a strive for. Now, you lost 60 days back in 2019 for contraband. What was that about? Failed urine test. That was the, the last write-up I had as far as drug-related or anything serious. That's about the time the turnaround so started. 2019, what did you, what did you, what was the positive form? Oh, uh, methamphetamine. How long have you been using methamphetamines while you've been in prison? Well, that was probably only second or third time I've ever done it in my life. And what programs have you taken since then? Uh, everything as far as thinking for a change, living in balance, age or age. I'm in pre-release right now. We finished that Friday. Uh, second second uh, phase of uh, living in balance. Uh, in 2019, you'd have been probably in prison, what, 24 years? 14 uh, years? Yes, sir, 14 years. Still doing drugs? Well, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It surfaced at that time, and I, I did use them, and it resulted in something bad because I ended up getting in a fight that day. That's That's how I was caught. And you mentioned earlier that maybe the light came on around 2019. Is uh, is that kind of when you, you you realized you needed to do something about that? It was right after I got out in out of the cell block for that that write up that things started to change. But I had several several officers here that reached out and tried to help me and really talked to me as far as changing and helping me be a per better person. And that's when I started getting back in school. Sort of taking the classes and trying to do better. Tell me where you live, Mr. Odom, if, if you get out. Where, if you were released uh, on parole, where would you be living? 
I'd be living right beside my family. My sister and my father has purchased me a small trailer house, put it right there, right beside their house. And, and what and what sort of work would you do? Uh, initially, I'd be working on a farm. Be doing small work around a farm for just enough money to you know survive. It won't be much, a hundred dollars a day or whatever. But uh, I won't have any bills. My sister had all my electricity and water ran from her house. So I will have things to do, and I have several churches. My aunt, she's she's avid about putting me to work painting stuff. I've, I've learned to paint murals. Painted a lot of murals on the walls in Angola while I was there. Very creative. I can I can build build any furniture. I do well at jewelry. I have several people that's willing to give me opportunities as far as doing anything positive with my life, no matter what it is. And uh, let, let's talk a little bit about your triggers for drug use. What are your triggers? We talked a little bit about that, but tell me, tell me what what you learned, or what do you know, or do you know what your triggers are? Sure, I do. Uh, like I say, it's never been much on people, places, and things for me because I've always found a way no matter where I was or who I was around. My biggest triggers have always been pressure, uh, stress, and rejection. Being around people that made me feel less than or, and, and though they may not have even done it, I'm, it's just my perception of things. And I've always taken stress real badly as far as everything coming down on me at one time or feeling, you know, I got married last time I got out of prison. Why, I don't know. I did nothing but but hurt her and make her life more miserable. Uh, and that became a stressful situation because she had children. And I felt that I had to do all of this and be all of this suddenly, immediately after getting out of prison. It was just so overwhelming that I ran right back to the drugs. That's that's my biggest trigger. Mr. Odom, and I, and I appreciate your honesty. You know, you've been in prison for 20 years. And, uh, you know, the world was horrible when you went in. It's worse now. I mean, all you got to do is pick up a newspaper, read things. I mean, everybody hates everybody. It's just fighting. It's constant. You're going to be under all of those same stressors. Right? How are you going to deal with that? I'm going to deal with it a whole lot better. I'm dealing with, dealing with it as an adult state of mind now instead of a child like I was even 20 years ago. I was 30 years old, and I still thought like a child. I didn't have any responsibilities or concern to have any. Now I have responsibilities. I have four nieces and nephews that need me. Otherwise, they're subject to turn out just like they're going to go through all the misery and the pain that I did. If somebody doesn't teach them about, you know, if you don't listen to mama, certain things will happen. You know, and, and I feel like that's my responsibility now. I don't have any children. I don't have a legacy. That's my only chance to, to mean something or make a mark in the world is help them through life. Thank you very much. Uh, Ward Myers, what can you tell us about Mr. Odin? Well, Mr. Marabella, uh, Carson and I had a long conversation yesterday, and sure after listening to him today, you and I have the same thoughts. I mean, this, is, this is a classic case of just the disease of drug addiction, and he has not been able to shake it all these years. You know, he, he, was, you know, he was honest. Of course, he, he didn't have a lot of choice, but to be, he had a, a dirty urine sample a few years ago. But we discussed his drug usage in, in prison and on the streets, and we discussed the same things you discussed is, is the stress on the, uh, when you go home, the problems that you're going to incur. Uh, you know, he, he, is, he is the prime candidate for long-term substance abuse, as you alluded to earlier. Uh, you know, he has made a good change in the last couple of years. The, the write-up he got over being up early was, you know, really can, it's a minor but you know it's it's all a stage of learning and following the rules but he he definitely needs long-term substance abuse um you know he's a unique case he's done a lot of time but he still has a lot of time left to do um, i want to feel like he's ready but you know it, it does concern me that he did use drugs in the last few years and you know he just became eligible for parole the turnaround came so you know, I, I, I want to see him succeed. I think he's on the right path, but he definitely needs help, whether it be here with me or somewhere else with long-term substance abuse program because, you know, being a seventh offender is probably his last chance. Thank you, Warden. I appreciate your comments, as always. 
Any questions? I do. Uh, yeah. uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Oldham, uh, I, this information was available to us in the record. Uh, how much do you think, in, in speaking of your victim and, and the, uh, uh, the harm you caused him, how much do you think the hospital bill was for his care? Just one of his hospital bills. I, am, uh, I don't know much about bills or, or what they cost or anything. I've, I've never had okay. that. But hey, fair enough, fair enough. It's, it was uh, $54,003.62. That was the hospital bill. Uh, how long do you think he stayed in the hospital after he endured uh, what you did to him? From what I understand, ma'am, it was quite a while. I couldn't get five in weeks. The records I have show was five weeks in the hospital, and he never worked again. After he got out of the hospital, the records I have show, it reflect that he, his mentality was like a child. He was placed on disability. He had no short-term memory, and his long-term memory was described as coming and going. I just want you to be aware of your crime and what, what it did to Mr. Nether. There's nothing you can do about it, but I just want to open up your awareness as you uh, as you reflect on, on the choices that you need to make and the challenges that you have. I want you to be aware of the challenges that Mr. Netherland had as a result of your actions. And I, my hope is that it inspires you to dig a little deeper and do all you can to, um, to do the opposite in every area of your life. That's all I had, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Odom, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before the board votes? Yes, no, we have no, no, no speaking. Okay. They're, they're all observers. Okay. Uh, I'd like the board to know that what I did was inexcusable. It was unforgivable. Uh, not only by him, but by his family, I'm sure. I, I'll never be forgiven, and, and I can't blame him at all. Uh, I've never been a type of person that would hurt anyone. I've never been a type of person that was violent in any way. And I know that doesn't justify or, or make an excuse for anything I've done. I, I've often wondered how much I affected that man. And I've asked my family, my sister, and my dad that know people in that area throughout the years, what was wrong, you know, what may have happened to him, how I affected him. I never knew that it was that much. I never knew that I affected him that bad. I've always wondered if I affected him as far as long term or if I, I limited anything that he might have been able to do. I'm sorry. I never, I never want to hurt nobody like that. I've never been that kind of person. If I could take it back, if I could take all the pain or suffering and anything that he went through on myself, I would gladly do it. And I, I want the board to know that I'm sorry. I truly, am or sorry. Thank you, Mr. Odom. I'm ready to vote. Mr. Odom. Uh, let me say that uh, I, I, I believe you. I, I, I hear your sincerity. Uh, I, 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 uh, as Ms. Wise has pointed out, the crime that you committed was horrible. Uh, it, it does look from your record that probably it was uh, having to do with those drugs. Uh, with, with uh, you know, we become different people when we do drugs like that. And uh, I, I think you're on the right track. Uh, I don't think you're there yet. I think that, that with my experience, uh, especially uh, Ward Myers' comments, he's seen it as well. Uh, I think we'd be doing a disservice to you to let you out without giving you more tools to be able to handle the drug addiction. Uh, I do believe you're moving in the right direction. Uh, I, I do believe that that perhaps that uh, 2019 uh, uh, disciplinary write-up being caught with meth in your system, maybe that was the, the, the spark that, that got you moving in the right direction. Uh, you, you're, just, you're just not there yet. Uh, I do think that you could benefit from long-term substance abuse treatment such as Steve Hoyle or something like that within the Department of Corrections. 
Uh, and if you do get into that program, and we will recommend that you be allowed to, to, to participate in that program, uh, as Ms. Wise is often saying, sit on the front row, pay attention, and understand yourself. Uh, because it is a disease, and it's not willpower, and it's not the ability to not want to do it. Because you sit there right now, I believe a thousand percent that you believe everything that you're telling us about never going back to drugs, never going back to drugs. But it's not that easy. Uh, and and you, you talked about friends who get out of prison uh, and overdose and die. I told you earlier, I ran a drug court for 14 years. And it was those people that came through my drug court, it took them almost two, two and a half years to graduate. And many of them, uh, those that graduated, uh, all many of them went out and did well. But every now and then there was one that thought, well, you know, I can try this again. I think I'm, I'm cured. Well, they couldn't tolerate the drugs they used to take. And the new drugs on the street were worse. In 14 years, I went to 20 funerals, people who graduated from it. So it's, it's a disease that needs to be treated. Based upon that, based upon your criminal record, based upon the fact that you do have opposition, uh, and you need more probes, you need some some the, the long-term substance abuse. My vote today would be to deny, but to encourage you to stay on the track that you're moving on, and perhaps the next time you come before us, it would be a different vote. But today, my vote today is to deny. Ms. Wise? Uh, uh, to the, the family of the Netherlands, uh, I just want to extend my condolences to you all. I read, I read your letters that you all um, you all really stated very clearly the impact of this crime. And even to your family, uh, Mr. Oldham, I mean, they are going through as well. It's, it's a challenge on both sides. Uh, but for me, uh, my vote is denied. Uh, you got released on 5-9-23. You committed this offense June 22nd of 23. You went out for a bit, very short period of time. Uh, the impact of the crime on uh, the family, your poor, very poor supervision history. You were you were revoked multiple times on supervision. You have law enforcement opposition, and you have a poor institutional record. And has been stated the need for long term substance abuse treatment uh, to the point that you were teaching some classes in substance abuse. I wanted to get that much into you. Uh, that is my vote, sir. Best wishes to you. Thank you, Ms. Wise, Mr. Rocha. Mr. Chairman, my vote is the same for the same reasons. Mr. Odom, uh, you have three votes to deny your parole, but I think you're on the right track. So uh, continue to work hard, and, and uh, perhaps next time it will be a little different. So good luck to you, sir. Warden, I think this is our last case there. So thank you so much. We appreciate all your help. Yes, sir. Happy holidays, y'all, if we don't see y'all anymore. All right. Same to you. to you, sir.
ね。The Committee on Parole is called back to order. The time is 9.20. Our panel members today are Mr. Alvin Roche, Ms. Pearl Wise. My name is Tony Marabell. I'll be acting as chair. Uh, let's see, we have a little... Oh, I see the chair. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, with the staff, uh, our remote location is at Louisiana State Penitentiary. With the staff there, please introduce themselves. Deputy Warden Rochelle Ambo. Regional Admiral Classification. Pam Baroque Classification. Deputy Sergeant Transition Specialist. Carmen Chipley, Offender Records. Thank you very much. Uh, our first case is going to be Mr. George Gibson. Mr. Gibson, would you please give us your full name and DOC number? My name is George Timothy Gibson. My prison number is 97064. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Mr. Gibson, let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record, and then we're going to conduct a parole interview with you. Uh, we'll then ask Warden Ambo for any input that she might have uh, about your case. And then we'll hear from those people who wish to have input. Uh, currently today, uh, uh, on your behalf, uh, present either in Zoom or there with you at Louisiana State Penitentiary are the following people. Mr. Andrew Hunley with Louisiana Parole Project, he will be speaking. Lawless Gibson and Gail Gibson are present by Zoom, but will not be speaking, your brother and sister. Uh, Kalila Ramirez uh, is uh, on Zoom, your niece, and she will be speaking. Uh, Elizabeth Saji, sister-in-law, uh, Denise Perio, Kedra Gant, Loretta Marshall, and Quandra Gibson are all on Zoom observing and supporting you, but will not be speaking. Uh, your attorneys are Sophia McDonald and Catherine Matoya. Uh, uh, Ms. McDonald, I think, will be uh, the lead lawyer uh, handling your case today. Uh, Ma'am, would you make an appearance for the record, please? Yes, sir. My name is Sophia McDonald. I'm a staff attorney at the Equal Justice Initiative representing Mr. Gibson today. Thank you very much. Uh, also uh, speaking is a family member, Ms. Lindia Blunt, uh, and also uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Donnell Blunt, a family member who is present but not speaking, and David Perio is a family member present but not speaking. Uh, once we have our, our hearing, uh, you'll have an opportunity to say whatever it is you'd like to say to the board. Your lawyer will close out uh, to the board. I assume, Ms. McDonald, that's what you want to do. Uh, your lawyer will close out and then we'll vote. Uh, do you understand our process? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Marabella, just one question. Um, I wanted to clarify how many spots are allowed for speakers on Mr. Gibson's behalf? Okay, we have a three. Uh, the speakers are going to be Mr. Hunley, uh, Ms. Ramirez, and Ms. Blunt. You okay. Aren't counted as a speaker. You, you, uh, uh, is, does that answer your question, or was there someone else that wanted to speak? Or yes, sir, that answers my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and enter some information into the record, uh, Mr. Gibson. This is the matter of George T. Gibson, DOC number 97064. Mr. Gibson's date of birth is, is February the 23rd of 1965. He's classified as a second felony offender. Uh, he had a parole eligibility date initially of February the 23rd of 2010. He is serving a life sentence on the charges of armed robbery and two counts of aggravated kidnapping. Uh, Mr. Gibson, does that information sound correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, your case has been assigned to Ms. Pearl Wise. She will begin our interview process. Would you please answer any questions she might have, Ms. Wise? Good morning. Good morning. We meet again. I was on your last panel. Uh, uh, when was it? Um, 2020. Yeah, February 10th of 21, you uh you did a vote of two uh to one. And, uh, and I'm just stating this for the record. Then on uh in June of 2023, you applied for a rehearing and it was granted uh uh it was unanimous a uh, vote of three to set for your hearing. So here we are today. Uh so call out for the record uh how long you've been in jail? Uh over 42 years now. 42 years, and how old are you today? 58. You're 58, 58 years of age. Okay. Uh, what do you do every day at the prison? Well, I was mentoring prior to two years ago. I work in a doctor's clinic. Okay. You work in it. Okay. Because um, on the last hearing, we had said something about uh, reapply after you get class A trustee status and you take more programs. So what have you done about that from the well, last one to one year? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I took up moral compass and I uh, got my class A trustee status. Okay, good. When did you get your class A trustee status? Uh, I want to say maybe a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Um, That's why. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. He got his class A trustee status in February, February 26th of 2001. Okay. All right, right after the hearing. Almost right after the hearing. All right, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome. Oh yeah, you uh you were cutting yourself short there. Yeah, you was cutting yeah. yourself, you was cutting yourself real short. Yeah, because you actually got it. The hearing was what January twenty first, and you <laughs> February twenty six right after, and you've maintained it. <laughs> that's, that's good to you. So you work in, you work in the um you work in, tell us what you do every day now in the doctor's office. You said what was ever required of me. You know, uh, I was I was a mentor, and I that kind of like I got bored with that. In, in, Prison, when you're a trustee, you can pretty much go from one job to another, you know, be qualified. So I enjoy more, I, I enjoy working at the doctor's clinic more than I did mentoring. So I went back to the doctor's clinic. Okay. I was working at the doctor's, I was working at the doctor's clinic before I became a mentor. So I okay. got tired of mentoring, I went back to the doctor's clinic. Okay. All right. We're, we're not going to uh, speak about those knuckleheads and how challenging it was to a mentor. We're not going to speak about that. We put it, you just went back to your job. I'm just gonna leave that right there. But just just speak a little right. brief about your health conditions. What 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 is your uh, mobility like these days? I found out I was a diabetic right after the hearing. I okay. died of diabetes. And I've been doing my best to maintain and manage that. It's kind of hard in prison, you know, make sure you eat what's right. That's the challenge, making sure I eat correctly. Uh so I had good news a couple of months ago. My my, my A1C was under seven, so I guess that's pretty good. Yes, so it's just, yes. yeah, <laughs> just yeah. maintain, you know, uh, try to eat healthy and stay positive. Okay. All right, that's good. what. So that's uh, good to hear. Uh, so you are mobile, right? You can walk and everything. Oh, yes, oh, yes ma'am. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. I'm just trying to get a. And so t if you were successful today, tell us what your plans are. Well, uh, I'm going to the parole project. That's the First step. Uh, okay. I was glad I was accepted. Uh, I was pretty positive, you know, after you enter back into society. 43 years, you don't have to really get accustomed to living back in society, you know. Uh, my second plan is once I'm released from the parole project, is stay with my, my sister Denise and her, my brother in law. Uh, they have a job lined up for me. Uh, you know, just take it one day at a time. You know, I'm just blessed to have family. That's uh, willing to help me transition back into society. Very good. Very good. Uh, <clears throat> I want to say for the record that uh, your victim 
uh, mm -hmm. in this case is um, is unopposed. Your victim is uh, stating that whatever the parole board decides, uh, they'll be okay with it. So your victim, you don't have any victim opposition. And the other victims uh, in, in the other cases are we don't have any they're deceased or we don't have any comments from any of the other relatives. So it, it's safe to say you have no express opposition from victims or in your case. And I'll just say that for the record. Um, I think that's all I, I want to ask you because I, I, you know, I was, and you do have a good institutional record. Uh, and you had outstanding comments from staff. Uh, that, that was really good to, to hear uh, the things that they had, they had to say about how well you, how, you know, what kind of person you are. All right, so Warden, what can you share with us about uh, Mr. Gibson? Um, basically, everything that Mr. Gibson told you was true about his mentor. Uh, and he went back to the doctor's clinic to do uh, to do work in a doctor's clinic. Uh, he did finish more compass on August of 2022 and also regained his uh Minim, uh, well, he was a minimum A trustee. Other than that, I don't have anything else to add. Uh, besides, you know, his disciplinary report is real good. He hadn't had a report since 2014. All right, you, you said 2014. That was it. Yeah. Two, it was 14. Yeah. 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 2014. That's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot to mention that. Thank you for mentioning. All right. All right, that's all I had, Chairman. Thank you very much. You have a question, Mr. Rocha. Um, good morning, Mr. Gibson. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. <laughs> I see the last class that you completed was the Moral Compass. Yes, sir. Tell me what you got out of that particular program. Well, uh, it, it passed the ruling. I don't know when it came down. Uh, even though I was a mentor and before, you had to complete moral compass to be qualified as a mentor. The OC wanted us to take moral compass. And uh, so even though I wasn't mentoring anymore, I, I decided to, con to take the class in case if I decided I want to mentor again, I would be qualified to teach it. You know, uh, I enjoyed it. You know, it was, I enjoyed it. Uh, I learned a lot from it. You know, pretty much a lot of the stuff that I was, that they, that you taught, that they taught me, I was actually doing it before I became qualified, you know. Uh, sometimes it's stressful helping others. When I was a mentor, I was in charge of five people, you know, and you have to, you know, monitor. It's like having five grown kids, you know. <laughs> and uh, I've done it for close to two years. Uh, so that's why I took up more compass. It's, if I ever decided that I wanted to mentor again, I would be qualified to, to actually mentor. So the OC made it mandatory that you have to you have to you have to complete more campus to be a mentor. All mentors had to go through it in prison, you know. It would tell me what you got out of the program. Uh just basically learning to to, to communicate with people, you know, uh, solving problems, teaching them how to think, you know, uh how to think before you act. You know, uh I have a as you know, my my case, I uh I come to prison with only seven and a half years. So I, I pretty much went from seven and a half years to to two life sentences. So I, I use my case a lot uh, and, and guiding and mentoring other kids and that come to prison. They're so young. Some of them are 17 and 18 years old, the same age I was. So I, I, it just, it just, I just brushed up on my skills of being able to communicate with people and teaching things, you know, uh, sharing my own story, you know, about how, I made bad decisions, you know, uh, and I and I regret it. You know, I've done 33 years in the cell from that one bad decision. I often think about what I could have accomplished if I had just done this seven and a half years and completed my sentence and went home. So, um, thank, you. thank you, sir. I appreciate your response. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Roche. Now we'll hear from your supporters, uh, Mr. Andrew Hundley. Mr. Hundley, good morning. Good morning, uh, honorable board members uh, representing Parole Project today uh, and informing the board that Mr. Gibson continues to be a client of our program. Um, if released, George would uh, immediately come to our residential reentry program uh, where he would uh, be assigned a peer mentor as a case manager. Additionally, he would immediately have a 
uh, mental health and substance abuse assessment by one of our uh, staff social workers, uh, and he would complete phase one programming, uh, which would uh, give him guidance on technology, navigating uh, healthcare system, uh, navigating relationships with his family, uh, financial management, several other topics uh, that are necessary to ensure that an individual is successful. When they come home, and, and to be frank, we would be prepared uh, to, you know, how George is the kind of person we would be happy to provide long-term uh, housing support to. However, as you can see, George has an amazing family who, who is ready to provide him long-term support. So we'll work with his family once he finishes the first phase of our program. Uh, and he's ready to make that transition. We'll work with his family and probation and parole and continue to work with him for a minimum of 12 months after his release. But as this board's aware, once a client and always a client, uh, and, and we will be prepared to stand by George and help him, you know, with ever, whatever issues that come up and work with his family to ensure that the, the transition is smooth. We have a great deal of confidence in George as, as the board's aware George is here because he is a Graham lifer. Uh, and I know this board always looks to find growth and maturity in these cases. Uh, and unfortunately, I wish I could say each time uh, that we have a client denied that they take the board's advice. Uh, and, and as you know, sometimes they don't and they show up for, an, for the next hearing uh, and, and they've had problems since their last hearing or they haven't completed the programming. Uh, in George's case, I think one way that George clearly has demonstrated his growth and maturity is uh, he has not allowed the denial to set him back, to phase him. He's continued to push forward with a good attitude, and he has completed all the recommendations that the board's given him. That gives our organization a lot of confidence that he will he will be uh, willing to accept guidance and, and follow any advice that we give to him. Uh, for those reasons, uh, we look forward to supporting George on his release if this board grants him parole. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Huntley. We always appreciate your comments. Now we'll hear from your niece, uh, Ms. Kalila Ramirez. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. How are you? If you would please introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like us to know about your uncle. Yes, my name is Kalila Ramirez, and I live in California. When I last saw my uncle, I was five years old, and I have been to Angola to visit him one time since then, but I'm 46 now, and I have two grown daughters of my own who he's never met. So what I want to say is, in terms of his life sentence, he has served life. There's been people in our family that have lived and died. You lived their whole lives and they never got to meet him. He has nieces, nephews, grandnieces, lifetimes that are passing by without him. We kind of need him out here. So yeah, if you guys could just consider releasing him today, that would be amazing. It would be a dream come true for our family. He has been a model inmate, not sure how he's kept a positive attitude all this time uh, in the face of time served, in the face of injustice and everything that he's been through. So yeah, we're ready to have him out here. I think he would be much better off um, continuing his life. I think he served his time and we can move on from where we are right now. Thank you very much, Ben. We do appreciate your comments. Uh, now we hear from uh, this Lindia Blunt. Good morning. My name Hello. is Lindia Blunt. I'm a retired Navy veteran, and I'm here to speak on behalf of my cousin George. Um, I've prepared a statement. On behalf of the family of George Gibson, I would first like to thank God for this day as it is one we have been eagerly anticipating for quite some time now. We would like to express our most sincere gratitude to the administration, officials, officers of the parole board, and staff in attendance today. And I personally, personally would like to <clears throat> show my 
gratitude, and love to my family members attending virtually via Zoom. Upon completion of his parole program, should George be granted parole, George has a stable home to live in and with his sister, Denise, and her husband, David, a retired sheriff's deputy. Additionally, George will have gainful employment with his brother-in-law's lawn service company immediately upon coming home from the program. George, as you can see, has a huge support system, including but not limited to his siblings, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, cousins, and close family and friends. We all miss George dearly, and we cannot wait to help him successfully transition into a contributing member of society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Gibson, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before uh, we uh, turn it over to your lawyer to close it out? Yes, uh, first and foremost, thank you for a second hearing. And uh, I know this is not an easy decision to make when it comes to deciding whether or not you're going to let a man that's been in prison for 42 years back into society. Uh, I'd just like you to take into consideration that, you know, I'm, I'm not that same person. I'm, I regret the crime I committed. You know, I'm very remorseful for it. You know, you have to be uh, the 42 years of my life in this prison. You know, I regret my crime. You know, I wish I would have just took the time out to just thank before I act. I regret hurting my victims. You know, uh, my case was pretty big, kidnapping the warden and his mother. You know, I, I often think about if that would have been my mother, you know, what, what, what I have done. So, uh, i like the board to know if you grant me my freedom, I'm not leaving anything behind. I'm not leaving here bitter, feeling like the world owed me anything. You know, I think one of the reasons I was able to navigate 43 years is accepting responsibility, you know, that uh, I put myself here. You know, many times uh, you hear about cases like mine, as you can see, and you feel, well, you was raised wrong, you know. I know right from wrong. You know, sometimes as a child, or you make decisions. You make bad decisions that can cost you. Some children can make decisions and they would, you know, they recover from those bad decisions. I was just one, that statistic that made a bad choice. Went from seven and a half years to two life sentences. I regret it. You know, I regret, I regret it. I regret hurting my family as well as myself, the victim's family. I'd like you to take in consideration, even though you personally don't know me, I'd like you to look at my 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 prison record, you know. Uh, it wasn't, you know, I didn't I didn't just wake up one morning and say, well, you know, they got a grand bill coming up. Let me stop getting in trouble because uh, I'm going to make parole. You know, you just, you, you got to, you get tired of it, you know, to where you grow up and you stop getting in trouble. You know, you stop, you learn to think, you know, before you act and make righteous decisions. I feel pretty good about myself, you know, how far I didn't came. Uh, I don't know if you understand being a trustee is not just being able to be with civilians out at rodeo, but we're held accountable, you know, we're role models for, for prisoners, you know, for other prisoners, for other younger prisoners, to uh to just to learn how to do time, you know, just because you have a life sentence doesn't mean you have to stop educating yourself and stop growing. You know, and I like the board to take that in consideration. The fact before I had any chance of getting out of prison, my behavior changed because I'm a changed man. I'm not that 15-year-old kid who come to prison, you know, 40, 40, 42 years ago. I'm 58 years old. I'm ready for society. Uh, I know they tell you about the ones that come back. I'm not coming back. I like the board to take that in consideration. I like that opportunity to be with my family again and just to, you know, live the rest of my life in society, whatever God has planned for me. Uh, that's like that's all I have to say. Thank you for this hearing. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate uh, your comments. Donald, please. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on Mr. Gibson's behalf. The Equal Justice Initiative has represented Mr. Gibson for nearly 13 years. This is his second time before this honorable committee. As this board is aware, in 1982, at age 17, Mr. Gibson committed a serious offense for which he takes full responsibility. He, as you can tell, understands the recklessness of his actions and the harm that he caused to the victims, their family, and the whole community. And today at 58, Mr. Gibson is a completely different person from the boy he was 
42 years ago. He has matured into a deeply remorseful man who has dedicated his adult life to atoning for his past and rehabilitating himself. Mr. Gibson's demonstrated rehabilitation makes him exactly the type of person the U.S. Supreme Court had in mind when it required that juvenile non-homicide offenders be given a meaningful opportunity to obtain release. He has spent decades reflecting on his crime and participating in available programming at Angola to better himself. At his previous parole hearing in February 2021, where he had two votes to grant, the board recognized and commended Mr. Gibson for his commitment to self-improvement. Years before Graham, as Mr. Gibson was saying, he taught himself how to read, which is really remarkable given how challenging it was for him in school before his offense. And his new found literacy at Angola really expanded his consciousness and his faith. As Mr. Gibson has told me personally, you do better when you know better. So as his literacy improved, his way of thinking changed, his prison record improved. In fact, by 2000, Mr. Gibson had earned his ministry credentials and had continued to participate in religious programming and other programs that really wouldn't be possible if he hadn't committed himself in this way to educating himself and to bettering himself. As you'll see, he's completed the 100-hour reentry program, anger management, the literacy program, among other programs. And as a result of his clear rehabilitation and demonstrated leadership, Mr. Gibson was appointed to serve as a mentor in the behavior management program at Camp C. And in that role, he helped to support a cohort of men and really set an example for them and explain how they can turn their lives around after uh, making really terrible decisions like he did when he was a child. Despite challenges in recent years, as Mr. Hundley has alluded to, Mr. Gibson's record has only improved. As this board knows, it's not unusual for um, someone's prison record to decline or, or worsen after a parole denial. But in Mr. Gibson's case, his record only improved. He um, finished the moral compass course. He maintained his near decade long clear disciplinary record and he earned his class A trustee status, which speaks not only to the high level of trust that the prison administration has in Mr. Gibson, but also to the tools he has developed to cope with stressful moments in his life. His home plan is with the Louisiana Parole Pro Project who will provide wraparound services. And once a transition is deemed appropriate, he will go to live with his sister and her husband who's former law enforcement in Terrebonne Parish. Um, and of course, Mr. Gibson will have the continued support of EJI if he is granted parole. Mr. Gibson's record speaks volumes about his maturity, his remorse and rehabilitation. So today we respectfully ask this board to consider all of these factors and grant parole subject to any conditions deemed appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Ms. Wise, yes. would you ready to vote? Yes, ready to vote. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's always a, a pleasure for me when I'm able to vote the same thing uh, a second time. And again, that speaks to, to your good, how well you've done. You did a great harm and you acknowledged that. You healed and you've been helping others. And that's all we can ask. So my vote is to grant for the same reasons I granted before. You lack victim opposition. I know that that has been expressed. Outstanding family support on Zoom and at the institution. Uh, the positive warden's comments and your excellent transition plan. Uh, best wishes to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. oh, special conditions. Uh, my only special condition is uh, probably about eight months after release. Uh, they start doing some community service. Uh, you you uh, you can figure out what you want to do. You want to you know do testimonies and whatever, but just give back to the community in some way. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gibson. Yes, sir. After serving eight years on this board, I can't say that I've had an enjoyable time. I enjoyed your interview. <clears throat> you were honest, you were sincere, and uh, that's very refreshing. 
Thank you. Mr. Gibson, I see what I'm looking for. I'm looking for full maturity and rehabilitation. And I saw that this morning. So based on the length of incarceration, positive remarks by Ward Ambo, excellent transition plan, family support, my vote is to grant your early release. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm oh, going sorry. to put a, a curfew on you from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. And I want you to do that community service that Ms. Wise was talking about with disadvantaged youth. Yeah. You are a teenager when you were arrested. And you have a story to tell. How to tell your story and lead the young people in the right direction. Yes, sir. Mr. Tim. Thank you, Mr. Rocha. Uh, Mr. Gibson, uh, I, I echo everything that my colleagues have said. Uh, uh, I uh, really did enjoy your interview. Uh, you know, if, if I were sitting there, I probably would be a bitter man. Uh, you're not. And I think that's critical. That's very important. And you have a, a tremendous story to tell young people today. Uh, we live in a horrible world today. It's worse than it was when you were out. Uh, I, I do believe that, that you are in a position to do a lot of good. And uh, my vote today would be to grant as well with all of the same conditions uh, good luck to you, sir, and uh, good luck. Thank you. You're welcome.
Olha só. Olha lá, what the fuck, olha lá. And the mic got off. Good morning. The Committee on Parole is called back to order. Uh, the time is 9.58. Our next case is Mr. Kevin Scholes. Mr. Scholes, would you please introduce yourself and give us your DOC number? My name is Kevin Scholes, DOC number 270-357. Thank you. Mr. Scholes, let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record, and then we're going to conduct a parole interview with you. Uh, and once we do that interview, we'll ask the warden for any input she might have, uh, and then we'll allow those persons who, have, who wish to have input to speak. 
Uh, currently to, today, uh, Mr. Robert Lancaster uh, is here as your attorney. Ms. Adrienne Hutchinson is a law student attorney. Chandler Thornton is a law student attorney. Uh, present uh, today, but not speaking, is Eric Calvin, Melissa Chris, Jennifer Cameron, and Chad Cameron. Uh, Mr. Norris Henderson is here. Uh, Daryl Waters is here. Vanessa Montgomery is here. April Montgomery is here. Herman Turad uh, is also here. Cedric Williams, Tracy Thomas, Terrence Wynn both wish to speak. Christy Sheremy with the Louisiana Parole Project wishes to speak. Uh, Mr. Uh, Lancaster, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna allow either Mr. Norris Henderson or Mr. Uh, or Miss Christy. Uh, share me with the uh, Louisiana Parole Project to speak because we have more than three speakers. So uh, is there anyone else that you'd wish to, to cut besides the one of them? So Mr. Marabella, if, if Mr. Henderson and uh, uh, Ms. Jeremy can speak and uh, Mr. Wynn is here in support, but he'll defer to, to Mr. Henderson. Terrence Wynn, okay, thank you. So he'll 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 defer speaking. Uh, once once we have the hearing and once we listen to everyone, uh, Mr. Schultz, you'll have an opportunity to address the board. Uh, and once you do that, uh, then your lawyers will will finish up and wrap up and make an argument to the board, and then we'll vote. You understand our process and procedure? Yes, sir. This is the matter of Kevin P. Uh, Kevin F. Scholes, DOC number 270357, date of birth January the 15th of 1966. He's a third class felony offender. Uh, he has an adjusted good time date of March the 30th of 2026, a full term date of September the 4th of 2031. He is currently serving a 34-year sentence on the charge of manslaughter, having been sentenced on June the 22nd of 2023. Uh, Mr. Uh, Scholes, is that information accurate? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, your case has been assigned to uh, Ms. Pearl Wise. Would you please answer any questions she might have? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Wise. Good morning, Mr. Shows. Uh, how's it going? How's it going? I'm a little nervous, but um, is it, I'm a little nervous, but you know, I'm okay. If you wouldn't, have, go ahead. Ms. Wise, excuse me. Uh, we we do have some opposition, and I'm sorry. I apologize that I did not call out your names. When you get old and you can't read, and you have to jump in different places, so. Uh, Warren Ray McKay the uh, third is here and would like to speak, and Lynette Sailors is here but doesn't wish to speak. She's just here as a friend. So thank you very much, and I apologize for not mentioning it earlier. All okay, right, Ms. Wise, no, I'm sorry. No problem. No problem. All right, uh, Mr. Kevin, is this your first parole here? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so call out for the record how long you've been in. You've served on this sentence. Twenty six years and three months. Three months. Okay. And how old are you today? 57. Age 57. 57. All right. Um, uh, tell me your marital status and how many children do you have? Um, currently, um, my wife, she passed away in um, 20 and 2020. Yes, yeah, she passed away. Um, um, I have three sons. Okay. And, oh, and I currently, you know, converse with them. Yes, sir. What were what the ages of your son? Uh, 12. Not 12. 16 and 23. Okay, those are the those are the children of your, your wives, right? Yeah, they passed away. Yep. And your wife that passed away. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry for your loss. I, I did see that in the record. Thank you. Yes, indeed. I know that was hard. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what you've been doing. Uh, let's go and get you a disciplinary because the last one, I forgot the disciplinary. When was your last write up? Twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty one. Yeah, you've had uh, a total of what thirty two write ups in in twenty six years, right? Yes, ma'am. 
And what was uh and before 2021, when was your last write-up before that one? It was uh I'm trying to see can I find it? I didn't put it in my note. It was uh do you remember when was your last write-up before 2021? Um Yes, 2016. It was 2016. Okay. Yes, so, ma'am. And the one in 2021, what was that about? Uh, it was I got caught with a cell phone, possession of a cell phone. Yes, sir. And what was that about? Um, I was wrong, Miss Wise. You know, I was going through, you know, some things, and I know I wasn't supposed to have it. You know, Miss Wise, and I make no excuse. You know, um, I was just. I was just wrong, you know. I had it. I knew I was supposed to have it. And I just made a bad decision, Miss Pearl. I, uh, now, I thought during that time when you had it, when you had it, there was some stuff going on with your family, huh? Was it, yes, ma'am. What was going on? Well, you know, again, my wife had passed away. Mm -hmm. You know, my sons, um, Miss Wise, you know, I, I challenged them to not be like me. I realized the mistake I made. They are young boys. They are very educated. And, you know, I just needed the time to, they lost their mom, you know, and I didn't want to be a product of me, you know, and I make, again, I make no, you know what I'm saying, excuse why, because it's a violation of the prison, but Miss Wise is just that, you know, my kids, you know, I, I just felt that I needed to stay in contact with them. You know, so they don't become a product of what's happening now. Okay. You know, when I was reading that, that's what I that's what I that's what I had surmised. And I just wanted to hear from you. Was, yeah. Was that was that what was going on with the cell phones? Um, the uh when I look at your, your program that you've taken, um uh, you've taken thinking for a change. Uh you and you just finished that in, in 23. I mean, yeah, I think June 28th or 23. What what was your takeaway from from thanking for a change? That's one of our premier programs. Thank you for a change, Miss Wise. It taught me a lot. It, it taught me thinking controls my actions, my behavior. Um, it taught me that even in this situation, you know, if I would have thought, I wouldn't have been in this situation. I wouldn't have, you know, hurt the friend because he was a friend. I wouldn't have hurt my friend. You know, thinking for a change teaches you your behavior, you know, to to think about what the consequences would be if a situation comes before you. Um, it really gave me, you know, a better sense of direction, you know. Um, and again, I can think better now than before, you know. A lot of things I would do different now because I can thank it through instead of acting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, and, and so the situation with the cell phones. When you go back and look at that situation through the lens of thinking for a change, what would you have done differently? I wouldn't have used that cell phone. I wouldn't have had that cell phone. That's and first and foremost. How could you have reached out to your family within the institution? Um, I would have, you know, reached out to my family members and asked them to put money on the phone that I can, you know, stay in contact with them. You know, I would have wrote letters, you know, that kind of stuff there that wouldn't have got me that violation, Ms. Wise. That's what I wanted to, and could you have gotten with the, uh, somebody in the institution and let them know you have a crisis to, to call home more often? Yes, I could have went to the classification office, you know, and they would have obliged me with a, you know, phone call when I tell them what the circumstances been, they would have giving me that phone call. They know you just lost your wife, so that that's ma'am. Okay. Good. That's what I. That's the kind of thinking I want to hear. Uh, yeah. Since you, you brought up the crime, t tell us a little bit about the offense. Uh, what I'm what I'm particularly uh, interested in is your relationship to the young man that uh, that you killed. And did you? Uh, there's some discrepancies in the record that you robbed him, and then there's some. So what is your statement today? What was going on? He was my friend, first and foremost, Miss Wise. I was on drugs, and I went there to get high that night. Um, there was a gun there, and, you know, I picked the gun up, 
mishandling the gun, and I shot him. You know, um, it wasn't intentional. You know, Miss Walker, this was my friend. You know, um, and I freaked out and I ran to say to rob him. No, so I didn't go to rob. Let me be clear. Your statement is that you were just handling the gun, and then it went off. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's what you're saying. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, there was no beef between y'all and nothing. No, this and was my was, friend. It's your this friend. was totally there's my some... friend, Miss Wise, like a little brother to me. He was like a little brother to me. Now, there's know? some indication in the record that he was a drug dealer and he was your drug dealer. I have no recollection of that. Okay. Miss Wise. That is not no. the case. Your statement today no. is in the record. That's not the case. Yes, ma'am. He was your drug dealer and you were there buying drugs from him or getting drugs or whatever, making an exchange. And but your statement is that you guys were just friends and y'all were just getting high together. Yes. He wasn't selling no drugs. There's no okay. yes, ma'am. So they said, they said it was, you know, over three thousand dollars in the ceiling, and uh, after you ran it out, those three thousand dollars would no longer could be found in the ceiling. That's in the record, that's all. Yes. No, Miss Wise, <laughs> I don't know nothing about no money. Okay. That this guy was selling drugs. That's not, you know. Okay. You know, okay. And and now uh, that's one of the beauties of having a parole here. You you, you get to have your say. You yes, ma'am. And uh, and this and because I wasn't there. Okay. Nobody else in here was there. Yes, ma'am. With the only one there. So what you say is valuable, uh, valuable to me. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the reason you were, you're here now. You you were able to. Uh, re get resentenced on a manslaughter on the charge. Go, go ahead and put that on the record for us. Or you want your attorney to put it on the record for us? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, he was uh, resentenced in June of 2023. Uh, the state and Mr. Scholes entered a joint Ramos resolution whereby he pleaded guilty to manslaughter and received a 34 year sentence. Okay, great. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. If you're successful today, what are your plans? My plans is to enroll in the um, reentry program, which is um, the parole project. And I want to enroll in a substance abuse program to mm -hmm. continue my sobriety, you know, and hopefully be an advocate, you know, to, to, to people on drugs as well as kids that they don't make the mistake that I made, Ms. White, you know, um, and that is my plight, you know, to keep myself, you know, around positive people to stay in this program because drug addiction, you know, I have found is an ongoing thing. And first and foremost, Ms. Wise, I fell out of love with myself. Not loving myself caused me to do drugs. Coming to prison, you know, even though I, I hurt my friend that I regret every day, but you know, prison taught me, you know, to have empathy for, you know, the victims, family members, and people, the community, because I destroyed the community. I destroyed other friends, you know, my family for the hurt I caused, dealing with drugs. So my plight is to continue on my sobriety, you know, I want to be an advocate to youths, you know, and anything that I can do positive, Miss Wise, to at least Make my friend's spirit happy, you know, because I did something terrible, you know, and, and and I have to live with that every day because he was my friend. And I'm still feeling bad behind that, Ms. Wise. And all I can do is, you know, continue to better myself, to show mm -hmm. myself a proof. I appreciate it. I, I think we got your sentiment. When I, when I look at your disciplinary record, you don't have any intoxication writers. So, no, um uh, what kind of treatment program? Do you think you need any more substance abuse treatment or do you think you got it? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, what? I would love to enroll in a, a substance abuse. I, I'm talking about abuse, before you go. Uh, before, program, you leave, before you leave, I'm sorry, I didn't phrase it right. Uh, so, what is your sobriety plan? How do you plan on staying clean and sober? To enroll into a, a AA um, program out in society. Mm -hmm. Um, I have uh, I have notified a few of uh, places that they are welcoming me. You know, I have to sign up on arrival, but um, I have contacted a few 
my family members have also contacted a few places that that I can enroll in and be happy to accept me. So what what's what's some of the biggest programs you've had uh, over these twenty six years? What have you taken? Thank you for a change, victim awareness. I'm no, I'm talking about right. substance abuse. Substance abuse. Right. A A A A substance abuse. Those are the two main you know um right. programs that. So I what have age, taken. What age did you start using drugs? I think it was in your brief. Um, you remember I started, what age? I started using drugs when I was about 19. Okay. okay. Um, and, and your brief, uh, they did point out that you had no violent DBs in, in the last uh, nine years. Uh, and that you, uh, there's an indication that you like education uh, in your record. Uh, speak to that. Do you uh, have a high school? Excuse me, I didn't hear you, Ms. Wise. Uh, do you have a high school? Do you have a high school diploma? No, ma'am. Tell me about your challenges, ed educationally speaking. Um. My only challenge is math. You okay. know, I always had a a problem with math. You okay. know, uh, trigonometry and so forth. Those, you know, uh, parts of it. Um, but division, addition, subtraction, you know, multiplication. You know, I'm pretty, you know, knowledgeable with that. Um, and I make no excuse, Miss Wise, why I didn't. You know. Accomplish my GED, you know, but you know I'm I'm preferably educated. Well, not educated on paper, but you know, Miss Wise, I'm 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 able to comprehend, have you good complete, comprehension. You complete pre GED, it says. You, so you are you can read and write. You can yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. You just kind of yeah. Okay. All right, then that's that's all I have. Uh, Warren, what can you share with us about this young man? Uh, Mr. Scholes is a minimum fee uh, trustee. He's assigned to death row as an orderly. Um, he did complete Thank You for a Change. He also was a member of the CPR team. Uh, he had a bunch of faith-based certificates that he did uh, and leadership skills. Um, he did take a substance abuse class. Well, it was a substance abuse clinic that he took in 2001. So he can use a more A A N A. Um, he did Malachi Dance, Inside Out, and Anger Management. Um, as far as his education um, background, he started taking a GED in 2009, and he made it to the end level tape test, which is pre GED. He dropped out the program um, in November 2009 for personal reasons, and then he re-entered the program. Um, July 31st of this year. So he's on a backlog for his GED to do the GED testing. I said testing. All right. All right. Thank you, Ward. It's on our head, Chief. Now we'll hear from your supporters. Uh, we'll hear from Mr. Norris Henderson. Good morning. Uh, I've been knowing Kevin. I, was, I, was kind of, I really appreciate the, the questioning uh, from his wives, especially when the the term just kept coming up, mistake, mistake, mistake. And listening at Kevin, and I, I kind of like jotted down something that somebody told me when I was a kid, that fools learn from their mistakes, but wise men from the mistakes of others. And I think over time, Kevin has kind of like really come to grips with that, about him wanting to be an example for those three boys of his, and kind of like realizing now, juxtaposing them kids in the situation where he's at and hoping that they learn from his mistake as opposed to going and making a mistake on their own. Uh, I've been with uh, Kevin. Uh, it's kind of like we, my nephew is Kevin's cousin. And so, you know, we're, I guess, kind of family in a sense. Uh, but I've been supporting Kevin since the day he showed up. I am partially responsible for Kevin getting resentenced. Uh, and one of the things that that hearing was 
the judge asked me to try to facilitate through the victim uh, reconciliation program, you know, a, a healing process. And so I've been working with the victim advocates from the district attorney's office here in New Orleans, uh, trying to facilitate at a time and place when the family is ready and willing. And so I've, you know, we've offered that up. Our organization is here for Kevin. Uh, Tracy, his fiance, uh, does a lot of volunteer work with us. Actually, she's actually a member of our organization. And so we're here to support Kevin in every which way we can. Uh, to help him make a smooth transition. I saw Andrew yesterday at a conference here, and Andrew told me that uh, they would be taking Kevin in the event that he's successful today. And I expressed to Andrew that anything that we can do for his wraparound services, uh, we're here to support him uh, 100%. Thank you. Uh, now we're here from uh, Tracy Thomas. Good morning. I'm here in support, of course, of Kevin Scholes. Um, I'm the Fort Worth, Texas support, should he be granted. Um, and we have connected from um, on the support end with pro the project, parole project here, and connected also with um, connecting. Um, making a change re-entry, which is a part of Fort Worth. Um, we also have support and are waiting for Kevin um, in the Texas area through community as well as church and other um, areas of outsource. So in the event, um, and we're hoping that everything works out well for him on today, we're looking forward to assisting him in every way and supporting him financially personally, myself, financially, and making sure that he does take the proper steps to communicate and advocate for what has happened. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, now we're here from uh, Ms. Christy Sheremy. Good morning, Honorable Board. Christy Sheremy representing Louisiana Parole Project. Um, we just want the board to uh, know that uh, we fully support Mr. Scholes. And um, if things go um, in a positive direction for Mr. Scholes today, uh, we uh, want the board to know that he will uh, be entering our intensive programming phase one, and we will provide all services that, um, that we do provide to all of our clients. Um, to my understanding, record shows that Mr. Scholes has a, an approved ICOTS to Texas. And so after successfully completing all programming, we will make sure that Mr. Scholes gets to his destination and um, provide any services and uh, continued case management throughout the, the next 12 months of his release. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Uh, Scholes, is there anything you'd like to say before we turn it over to Mr. Lancaster and uh, Mr. Thorne? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I keep cutting him out. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Warren Ray McKay. Yes. Mr. McKay, you wish to speak? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Just give us your name. Name is Warren McKay. I'm sorry. Kevin been lying to you from the beginning. But you can't tell you which gun he picked up in there because he didn't pick up a gun. He brought it in there. He's lying to you. Because the gun that was in there was still in there after he left. They were in touch under that bed. When he had us in him with, he came with it and he left it. And I knew exactly what he did for me. He killed my brother. He took the money. He didn't know where the drugs was. But my brother wasn't his drug deal. He was planning on robbing my brother and killing my brother. But she was not coming to that house. He only came to the house one time, one day, two times in one day, killing my brother out. My brother did not deal with him. He knew exactly where he was going. When you let him out, he's going to do the same thing. You see, he changed. He 
for the church, getting his education. Oh, that could have been done, what, 20, 20 years ago? 15 years, 10 years ago, that could have been all done and over. It's just an excuse. Just one big excuse. I guarantee you get back out there. Either you're going to be up in here, or you're going to be in somebody's grave. I haven't changed. I still feel the same way. The only difference with him spending 30 years up in here is the five minutes that cops saved his life from me. And I was five minutes from killing him. And they was coming out the doors with him. They saw me in that police station. And I phoned him that same night. And when I phoned him, I'm telling you, I was getting ready to kill him. Until my cousin come out of that door with him. He told me, if I kill him, I'm going to jail. Don't believe what he's saying. I'm telling you, he's lying to you. You always lie. So whatever he's trying to prove himself or whatever he's trying to do, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. He can go wherever he wants, but in my eyes, he's banned from the walls. I don't want to waste my family. I don't want to know where around my family. He's banned from them. The judge I can come home, I left right after my brother got killed. I leave the neighborhood. Katrina come, I move out of state. A judge that can come home, he come home, I'm coming home. I, I haven't changed. I'm being honest. I still feel the same way. But I don't want him around my family. Don't let him lie to you because it is a lie. That's all it is, just a lie. Thank Sorry you. for my behavior. <laughs> okay, Mr. Charles, anything you'd like to yes. say? Um, yes, I would. And as I spoke before, board, I understand. And he has right to feel that way. And I apologize for my actions. I am a better person. And I will strive, as I said before, at our court hearing, to be better. <clears throat> I will do everything in my power to ask him for mercy, plead and beg him for his mercy for forgiving me for the hurt and pain I've caused. Can't change the situation. Mr. Merrill Bella, I can only you know, strive for positive and make it better. Um, I have no kind of against him or his family because, again, this was my little brother. And I made a terrible decision. And, again, I apologize to him, and I will continue, Mr. Merrill Bella, to plead for his mercy and forgiveness. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Thornton, you want to close out for us? <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, so I've assisted Mr. Scholes in his case before the parole board today, and getting to know him and hearing his story has uh, really made a you know positive impact on my life. It's made me a better person. Is that, and as you can see from all the support he has today in the room and on Zoom, he has that effect on a lot of people. He'll be the first to tell you that he needed prison. And he's not proud of the person that he was, but after 27 years, he is proud of the man that he's become. Um, his his first administrative release date is coming up soon, uh, but he's ready now. He's done the programming that that is necessary. Uh, he understands the impact of his crimes, and he's looking forward to making a positive impact on his community. Um, he's sober. And he's committed to his sobriety. Even after all these years of sobriety, he hasn't forgotten how terrible it is to be in the grips of addiction. And he's committed to doing whatever it takes to stay sober. He's committed to finding those 12-step uh, programs and uh, sponsors that will help him and to rely on the Louisiana Parole Project and the uh, reentry program in Texas when he goes there to help him to remain sober. Um, in addition, he has the support of a, a competent and self-reliant fiance has the support of many prison peers who are here, who have spoken, many of whom wish to speak, but we just couldn't have them speak because of the limit. And uh, um, and he wants to follow in their footsteps of making a positive impact on the community after their release. Uh, granting him discretionary release today allows this board to impose conditions on his release 
that will ensure that ensure his success upon release. And uh, so for these reasons, we humbly ask this board for a vote in favor of his release under any conditions you deem appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're great, huh? I recommend executive session to discuss confidential matters related to this case. Second, there's been a, a motion in the second uh, to go into executive session. Uh, would you please call the roll? Yes. 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 Thank you. Uh, there's been a motion in the second for executive session. Uh, we're going to be in uh, executive session for uh, to discuss confidential matters. The time is 1030. We will be at a short recess. We will resume as soon as uh, we finish uh, discussing the confidential matters.
Committee of Parole is called back to order. The time is 1035. Uh, is the panel ready to vote? Yes. Ms. Wise? Um, Mr. Kevin, this is, this is a very, very difficult case uh, on, on all sides. It's, um, I do want to stay to um, uh, Mr. Warren McKay. I, I appreciate what all it took for you to be here today. We hear you. Uh, we have to balance all the information that we received on all sides. And again, I am sorry for your loss. Um, and I spent a lot of time, uh, I read so much, uh, Mr. Kevin, too, I, I didn't even want to have any questions because I've read so much. The, the, the packet that LSU gave and your, and your other, I've read so much. Uh, and I, I'm going to go ahead and vote first and then I will state my reasons. Uh, my vote is to grant your parole after you complete a long-term substance abuse treatment program. I do think you need that before you go going forward. And I also want you to complete it while you're in DOC so that when you transfer to the Louisiana Parole Project, that's something you don't, you can get out of there a little sooner and get on the text that already be done. I, I want you to sit on the front row and really get those skills. Because uh, you don't know what it's going to be like. When you, if you've done well in prison, like I said, you didn't have any intoxication. But even if you can pass that knowledge on from a long-term substance abuse treatment program. Um, and this is due to you have a good institutional record. Uh, you, uh, you have positive comments from the warden. You have an excellent transition plan. And you have an excellent uh, family support uh, on both sides. And as a special condition, I do want you to stay in touch with the Louisiana Parole Project for that 12 years, 12 months that they offer is going to be through Zoom or telephone. Although you're in Texas, check in with the Louisiana Parole Project. They can hear you better than anybody else can. Uh, I do want you to uh, not return to the New Orleans uh, metropolitan area unless you have permission from your parole officer. Do not just, just don't go back. And I would like for you to give back to the community. Uh, and, uh, one year after release, start doing some community service in, in whatever way uh, you see fit. And I want you to continue to work towards your high set. Continue to work towards your GED. Uh, just slowly but surely. I'm not ordering you to get it, but I'm ordering you to stay enrolled and continue to work toward it. And uh, send us a copy of it when you uh, when you get it. Make sure you send the parole board a copy of your parole of your uh, high school diploma when you get it. That is my vote, and I'm only one yes, vote. Thank you, Ms. Wise. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Wise. Mr. Rochelle. Mr. Chairman, my vote is the same for the same reasons and under the same conditions before and after release. I want you to have a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m and to attend at least three NAAA meetings a week. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Roche. Thank you, uh, Mr. Roche. Mr. Scholes, uh, Mr. Scholes, uh, my vote is likewise the same with the same conditions. So uh, your parole has been conditionally granted upon your entering a long-term substance abuse program while in the Department of Corrections. Once you finish that program, if you're able to finish that program within nine months, you'll be released to the Louisiana Parole Project. Hopefully, your stay at the Louisiana Parole Project will be less long because of the treatment that you're receiving while you're in the Department of Corrections, which will allow you uh, to more quickly move to uh, Texas under your ICOTS to Texas. Uh, then you're going to have special conditions of curfew. Uh, you will have, uh, after you've been out for approximately one year uh, to do community service work, uh, you are not to return to the New Orleans metropolitan area without permission from your parole supervisor. Uh, I'll delete release recommendations from the treatment program. Okay, yes. follow all of the recommendations. Uh, from the long-term treatment program and work on your GED. It's not a mandatory requirement, but it's 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 a request that you continue to work on your GED. So good luck to you. So your parole has been granted condition. I thank uh, Chairman. I appreciate it. God bless y'all. And 
I appreciate the second chance, and I won't let you down. I won't let you down. Thank you. Good luck to you. You're welcome.
Committee on Parole is called back to order. The time is 1051. Our next case is going to be Mr. Daryl Thompson. Mr. Thompson, would you please give us your full name and DOC number, please? Daryl Quentin Thompson, 5196-11. Thank you. Mr. Thompson, uh, let me explain our procedure to you. First, uh, we're going to conduct a, first I'm going to read some information into the record, and then we're going to conduct a parole interview with you. Uh, we will ask the warden to give us uh, whatever input she feels is appropriate uh, to your case. Uh, and then uh, those persons who wish to have input uh, will be uh, allowed to, uh, to speak. Uh, currently uh, on your behalf today is Ms. Christy Sheremy with the Louisiana Parole Project, your sister Carrie Thompson, uh, your friend LeVar King, and your sister Felicia Kirby. Also present but not speaking is uh, Tracy Knox, Kelvin Vinzor, Ashley Thomas Talley, uh, Ariel Knox Faget, uh, Jennifer Knox, uh, and uh, also speaking in opposition is uh, Ms. Vanina Payne. Uh, once those persons have all had an opportunity to speak and we have finished our hearing, you'll have an opportunity to say whatever you'd like to say before the board, to the board, and then we'll vote. You understand our process? Yes, sir. Okay. This is the matter of Daryl Hugh Thompson. Date of birth is uh, March the 21st of 1979. He has a parole eligibility date of June the 27th of 2024, an adjusted good time date of March the 8th of 2042, a full term date of June the 26th of 2049. Uh, he is currently serving uh, a 45 year term on sentence on attempted first degree murder, having been sentenced on January the 16th of 2007. Uh, does that in, is that information uh, accurate, Mr. Thompson? Yes, sir. Mr. Thompson, your case has been assigned to me, so I will begin uh, the uh, interview process. Uh, Mr. Thompson, how old are you, sir? 44. And how long have you served on this sentence? 19 years and about six months. Tell me a little bit about uh, who you were back in uh, 2004. Tell me, I I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, Daryl Thompson back in 2004. Uh, at that time, how far had you gone in school? My senior year. Okay. Uh, you hadn't graduated yet? No, sir. I, I was out of school. I dropped out my senior year. Okay. Were you working? No, I was, I've was. i been unemployed for three months at this time. Where were you living and who were you living with? Me and my girlfriend were living together in Plaquemines Parish. Okay. And is that Leon Yoakum? Yes, sir. How are you supporting yourself? Well, I was looking for work. I had just recently lost my job, but I was, work, I was an oil refinery worker. Were drugs and alcohol involved in your life at all at that time? Yes, it was. Okay. Drugs? What kind of drugs were you using? Marijuana. Let's talk a little bit about how... Uh, let's talk a little bit about your drug use. How old were you when you first started using drugs? About 15 or so. And how often were you using marijuana at 15? At 15, it was every weekend. Yeah. And did you progress further to more often? Yes. After I, yes, when I got out of school, I started smoking more often. How often were you smoking? Oh, I went to every day. Did you ever use any other drugs? Cocaine, heroin, methamphetamines, anything like that? No, sir. Always marijuana? Yes. As you sit here today and look back on your life, uh, are you a drug addict? Yes, I am. Well, I'm a recovering drug addict. All right. So tell me a little bit about what happened. Let's talk about what happened on June the 26th of 2004. Now, I've got the police reports. I've got all the reports. So I know 
basically what happened, but I want to hear in your own words what happened, okay? Yeah. Well, I, I had just lost my job and was about to be evicted. And I had to try to find a way to come up on the money to pay my, to pay my rent or whatnot. And we thought of me, Leanne, my, which is my girlfriend at the time, thought, thought of a burglary. And we were pretty desperate. And we broke into a house. And, and in the process, Mr. Payne was killed. Well, you know, tell me specifically what you did. Yes. Okay. You know, I mean, you make it sound like an accident. No, I know no. it wasn't, and you know it wasn't. So tell me exactly what you did. No, sir, it was an accident. But we broke in the house, and while we were there, Mr. Mr. Payne came home. Mr. Mr. Payne came home, and it, we there was a struggle involved. And after the struggle, I went outside, and I heard a gunshot from outside. I came back in. Mr. Payne was shot. So you didn't shoot him, you're telling me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're telling me you didn't shoot him? or? Yes, sir. I'm telling you I didn't shoot him. Police reports suggest otherwise. Well, I don't understand why I did not shoot him. My girlfriend actually said she was the one who shot him. So then what happened? Well, after I seen what happened inside, we picked up and left. We took Mr. Payne's truck and left. Did you beat Mr. Payne? Yes. What did was, you beat we, him? He was hit with a hammer. And what did y'all do with the truck? Dumped it. Dumped it in the lower night ward. You burn it? Yes. What'd you do with the shotgun? It was thrown over a bridge. What'd you do with the money? The money was it was still at the house. Some of it was spent, but the majority of it was left at the house that we stayed in. Now you'd been previously convicted of burglary of an inhabited dwelling before. So this wasn't your first burglary, right? No, it wasn't. Tell me how you changed from that person who committed this horrible offense and, and, and killed someone. Okay. Sir, back then I was young, no patience. I always seen how, seen a lot of people make it family-wise. At that time, I had just started out on my own. I had no felt I was responsible for everybody. And over this time, I have patience now. And that person then is long gone. I better equip myself to survive in society. Now, you say you are in recovery drug addict. When was the last time you did any drugs? 2014. And uh, when, what, how, tell me about that. Well, up to that point, I was really, I was down and I had an episode. And once I came back from the episode, I realized that- What is an episode? Tell me what that means. The write-up was 2014 for- Oh, the uh, episode was right up. Okay, go ahead. So, the episode was the result of the write-up. I had a, I thought I was smoking marijuana and it would end up being a uh, mojo. And doing that after when I come back off the episode, I just realized drugs just wasn't for me anymore. I ended up taking a program, a substance abuse program afterwards. And upon what taking that- the substance abuse program you took? It was, a, I can't call the name of it. It was powers one and two, I believe. It was a- Living in balance. He did living in balance. He also did the LSP uh C Paul Phelps drug treatment in 2014. You took living in balance in 2000, looks like either 2014 to 2015. What did you learn in that program? You say that's 
kind of what helped you the episode and that helped you. What did you learn in that program? See, up, up until that point, I didn't realize I had a drug problem. I was I found out what I called myself was a a functional addict. I didn't know using drugs every day to eat for, for whatever reasons. It's still it's still a habit if you constantly need it. I learned that in that program. And from that point forward, I had to make fine change in myself. Let me stop you for a second. It's not a habit, it's an addiction. Yes, sir. Habit you can break. I really an addiction you can't. Yes, sir. Then so what else did you learn in that program? I learned my triggers. I realized what are, you, what are your triggers? My triggers are boredom, stress, and that's and unemployment, not working, not doing anything. I have to I have to stay busy. So how are you going to deal with your triggers? What's going to happen when when you get bored, uh, you get depressed, uh, you can't find a job, uh, life's problems smack you right in the face? What are you going to do and how are you going to stay sober when those things happen? And they will. Yes, they will. Well, I, I know I need a, need a support group. My family would be there to support me. And I know there's better ways than turn to drugs for, for answers. Oh, tell me about those better ways. Well, I know my addiction is boredom. I have to find things to be more creative. I feel I'm I will be volunteering for my community, helping out where I could to be able to help others. And I feel staying in something positive will help me from going back. I need those types of things, and I know the time out there will be hard, and I'm ready for those struggles and those challenges of it. What other programs have you taken that have to do with substance abuse that would help you while you've been in prison? Thanking for a change was one of them. Yeah. Thank you for doing thank you for change is it just it showed me. Well, you don't have to turn to that's education, and that's very good. That wonderful. You taking any treatment programs while you've been in prison? It was the the, the living in balance was was a treatment. And no, that's not treatment, that's more education, but go ahead. So I, I didn't take any classes outside of those. Now, you were in Celebrate Recovery, which is an excellent program. Tell me about Celebrate Recovery. I didn't, what did, I didn't, what I, did you learn in Celebrate Recovery, if anything? I didn't stay in Celebrate Recovery, sir. And why not? Well, I've never been a religious person. I pray. I, I always held my own church. And the, that program itself was centered around religion. I believe religion is something that religion chooses people who chooses to believe believe that way. Now I believe there's a God and all, and I believe that answer we all have to answer to Him, and there's a greater being. But that that particular program, it, used the, it was always centered around around the Bible and religion. So I, I just it wasn't fair to the people that was in class for me to to be there to try to participate, not feeling the way they do about things. What did you substitute for that program? What other programs dealing with substance abuse, because we both agree that you're an addict and it's not a habit, it's an addiction. What other programs, once you got kicked out of uh, Celebrate Recovery, what other programs did you try to get into that would help you deal with your substance abuse issue? I, I didn't take any other drug programs, sir. Why not? That, I think those are the only two they had off open at the time. Well, tell me about the 12 steps. Are you familiar with the 12 steps? The 12 steps for which program? Well, 12 step period, not a program, the 12 steps. What do you know about Alcoholics Anonymous? What do you know? I didn't anything take about eating? Do you know anything about that? No, sir. I didn't take Alcoholics Anonymous. I was like I said. I heard I needed needed that. Well, I believe I needed, and I was going to use it once I if I would have made it to the parole, parole project. No, they have that program available. Those too. things. Okay. Excuse me. Celebrate recovery covers those things. Okay. But you I chose didn't... not to do it. Yes, sir. Now, you've had 20 write-ups. Your last one was in 2021. What was that for? That was a 21, sir. 2021, right? Yes. I'm sorry? It was the six. Okay. 
And, and, and well, what happened? Tell them that. I was masturbating in the shower, and the CEO come back there. I didn't. I didn't hear. Her. I shouldn't have been back there doing it. That's. Now, how is it you were indicted for first-degree murder, right? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. And you pled guilty to attempted first-degree murder. Yes, sir. How did that come about? Mr. Thompson? That was in terms of the plea, the plea agreement. I'm sorry? That was terms of the plea agreement, sir. Terms of the plea agreement, and you agreed to a 45 yep. year sentence as opposed yes. Yes, to sir. either life or death, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And how much time have you served? 20, 19 years. At the time you took the plea agreement, how long did you think you would serve in prison? Life. What did Miss Yoakum get? 30 years. She got 30 years. You got 45 years, and you say she did the shooting. Yes. Where will you be living if you were to get out? Harvard, Louisiana. And who would you be living with? My sister, Carrie Thompson. You plan on going there initially, or are you going to go with the parole project? The parole project, sir. What do you understand the parole project will do for you? They'll help me get the benefits, the benefits that I'll, I'll need to actually start staying on my own, Social Security. Social Security, uh, they also will provide help to find work or not. What else would they do for you? They would give me a, a place to stay for the first six weeks. Anything else? Any other services that they might provide for you that you uh, think you need? They will provide a re rehabilitation program with AA, Ag which is Alcoholics Anonymous. Any which, help? They no, which, as you've indicated to me, you don't know anything about, right? No. Well, I, I know I, I, have, I had a problem. I have a problem and I need, I will need help. And Parole Project is willing to offer that help and I will accept all, any help I can get. Well, you were you were given the opportunity to take a program, celebrate recovery. There are other programs in the Department of Corrections that, that uh, help you with substance abuse, treatment programs that you haven't either requested to take, uh, but the Celebrate Recovery, you dropped out or got kicked out because you wouldn't Sir I, sir, I thought the, the substance abuse classes I took already, I thought that was I thought that was part of of the, the of help. So you thought maybe that's all you need? Yes, sir. Warden, what can you tell us about uh Mr. Thompson? So Mr. Marabella, I'm saying in his uh record that he took a, uh, a drug treatment program in 2014. That's uh, in addition to the dividend balance one and two that he had taken. So I'm I'm not familiar with this LSP, PCC drug treatment program. I was trying to look in his folder to determine further what it was about, but it shows a completion with TTRP credits. Um, he also has uh, his GED, he uh, NCCER accredited, uh, he's enrolled in electrical school. He finished outdoor power equipment technology. Um, he received an award from New Men, which is a sobriety group um, for some community service that he did there. Um, he also did victim awareness and his accountability letter training and um, T4C and 100 hours of pre-release. Thank you, Warden. Okay, of course. Okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, electrician is a is a very very good trade, 
Did you have that trade before you came to prison? No, ma'am, I didn't. Oh, okay. Cause I, and I do want to just say for the record and acknowledge the level that we got from uh, the facility manager, uh, as Mac, two of them signed the letter, commending you on your great performance and you've been doing it for two years. Yes, ma'am. Is that correct? Uh, so so uh, there was a mention you were in schools. So tell me what you're doing in, with first electrician and when would you complete it? Well, I started a job at the electric shop prior to my schooling. See, I needed the hands-on uh, first. I want to hear about the schooling. Uh, the, the, uh, the warden just mentioned schooling. Tell me about the schooling and when would you complete it? The, the LSP only offers the first two years of the program. I have six months left for the complete level two. But upon re release, there's two more years I have to complete that's not given at LSP. I'm probably about six months away from completing the two levels that LSP offers. Oh, okay. Um, so this is not a Voltec electrician trade. This is something that LSP is doing. No, this is it is a Voltec trade. Okay, it is Voltec. Yes, they only offer the first two levels though. Okay. What Voltec school are you going to? Electrical. Where? Where are you going? What is, there's is it IT Boston technical area? that I apply. Excuse me? The, uh, the, one, the program now is through BRCC. So you go to BRCC for the class? Yes. See, I don't know. If you don't tell me, I don't know. So tell me about electrician. The classes are all... Excuse me? I'm listening. Oh, it's, it's blanking out. I, I didn't hear the question. Yeah, I think it is. I do. I think it's blinking out too. Okay. But you go to BRCC for your electrician trade. Is that correct? Yes. And you have six months left to finish. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had, Chair. Thank you. Okay, now we'll hear from your supporters. We'll hear from Ms. Christy Sheremy. Good morning again, board. Um, Christy Sheremy representing Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, we just would like the board to know that we are here to uh, fully support Mr. Thompson if uh, if granted. Um, I know that um, from my records that he has long-term residency with his, with his sister in Harvey, and that would be um, where he would live after completing our uh, phase one programming. Um, we have resources here in the Baton Rouge area that we could immediately um, help Mr. Uh, Darrell become um, involved with. We would just have to make sure that we are accepted in such a substance abuse programs that are available out here. And so we would definitely be committed to that as well to help um, Mr. Thompson um, to completely just uh, with his sobriety and to make sure that he maintains that. Um, we would definitely make sure that he has a uh, case worker who would do case management. We, um, the Louisiana Parole Project um, is solely committed to uh, his reentry programming, such as helping him with uh, his social skills, social norms, uh, employment skills. We also have an enhancement program uh, being that Mr. Thompson has a electrician uh, certification and he's working towards that. And we can make sure that our team has him um, set up with employment opportunities in the Harvey area as well that we serve. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Now we'll hear from uh, Ms. Uh, Carrie Thompson. Excuse me. He would go up to that podium, ma'am. Just introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like us to know about your brother. My name is Gary. Gary is my younger brother. Two years. Um, he's been involved in the restaurant together. Never got that opportunity because of this situation. And I'm just trying to encourage him to, to seek the beginnings so we can we can support him the way he needed possible because we didn't know what he was dealing with when he was home. 
because he didn't he didn't talk a lot about his feelings. So we all we all weren't aware of his situation once he moved uh, once he moved from the mountains. He didn't he didn't communicate in communication with us because he knew, you know, he didn't agree so much with his house. Like because he had the potential to be better. He made good grades in school. It disappointed my mom deeply when he decided that he wasn't going to school. And since then, he lost both parents. All this, the, some of the support that he had, people that really would have helped him had they known what he was dealing with, are gone. Um, he's got the support of all my siblings. His other brother. I still have plans to, to, to open a restaurant, but I, I, I want to do it. I've got, we have uh, registered with the state for my business, named it after my grandmother. I just want to make sure that he has the support he needs when he does come home. Because this is the hard home, the whole family, because we feel like we've been in here with him. I bought my kid, my daughters to see him that were big. One of them wasn't born. One of them was big. You yeah. <clears throat> know. I took them to see him. And just this just the whole experience of going, going there, having them meet the loved one there was the most horrible thing I've other I've ever experienced other than my parents. I know he has the potential to be that. I don't hold my own self accountable for his for him doing it. I just want him to, to right to do the right thing, to be to do right. Because we need him. I need the support of my The whole family needs his support. He didn't get to he didn't get to properly grieve when my mom when my parents passed one, my dad from cancer, my mom had an anger or something, so I still don't get pain. He wasn't able to attend the him. He wasn't able to attend my grandmother's, my mom, my dad, or his mentor, which was my uncle, which he, he didn't talk to him. He, nobody knew who my brother was doing before, he, uh, before this happened. If he had communicated better, or been in communication, let us know what he was dealing with. We could have assisted Ben. We could have had them all these years, and none of it, no family would hear it. Just want him to, 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 to be able to re enter the right way and do things the right way. Because everything he did before before then could have landed him here. And I just, I just want him to be better. He's going to do better. Thank you very much, Meg. We appreciate your comments. Laura King. Uh, you can sit here right there. Um, my name is Lavar King. I'm a child of a friend of Darrell. Um, we attended elementary school as well as, as well as high school together. And unfortunately, we, re, we reunited here in the Louisiana State Prison. And we both transitioned into young men through the, through, I mean, grown men. Through the, through the trials and tribulations, we, we grew up, we recognized our mistake. And I now, since I'm free, I actually confide in Daryl while I'm in society. Daryl encouraged me and keep me motivated to stay the course. All to tell him, and he just he keep me focused. So there's no doubt in my mind that that would be a productive, a productive member and an asset to society, just as I am. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Felicia Kirby. She, 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 Ms. Kirby. She, um, she said she said, speak, but now she's on the phone. She's not on the phone? Now, audio's not Ms. Kirby, can you hear us? Ms. Kirby? She's here. All right, now we'll hear from the opposition. 
We'll hear from uh, Miss Vanina Payne. Miss Payne, can you hear us? Yes, sir, I can hear you. You hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can. If you okay. will introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like us to hear. Okay, my name is Vanina Payne. I am the daughter of Lionel Payne Sr. And I am here to represent the whole family and opposed of Daryl getting out. Well, because you're going to wait. Hello? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Oh, yeah, it went black. Okay, I'm sorry. But we're still here. We can hear you. Okay, because I feel that I lost someone I love very much because of that foolishness that happened that shouldn't have happened. And we are hurting today because of it. We all have issues, anxiety, depression. We're going through a whole lot because of it. So I don't feel that. Well. Well, what? I mean, who's speaking? Me? Who? What's going on? I I, I don't know who that was, ma'am. But that's not us. So if you would just continue, I don't know someone. I, I heard something too, but uh, it's got nothing to do with us. So. Okay. Okay. So so you know we are hurting because of it, and I really don't feel to believe that he is ready to come out in society. Okay, um, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Thompson, is there anything you'd like to say before the board votes? I thank you all for hearing my case today. And I want to apologize. I'm really hurt for my actions and what I did to, to Mr. Payne. And it shouldn't have happened. With the, Mr. Payne's family, the community have every right for to be upset and hurtful for me. I've been carrying this burden for the last 20 years and there's nothing I've been able to do to get, be able to get this weight off my shoulders from what I've done. But the thing I can do is help and try to help as many people as I can to relieve the stress of, of, of what I've done. Given the opportunity, I will do all I can to make amends. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thompson. I appreciate it. Uh, yes. All right. Uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, I, I, I've listened to you very intently. Uh, uh, you, you've taken some some pretty good programs. I mean, the warden has outlined uh, a lot of things that you've accomplished, uh, uh, and uh, you know you've got a pretty good prison record. Uh, you, you've done well while you've been in there. Uh, my biggest concern, twofold. Number one, uh, this was a murder. And you were allowed to plead guilty to an attempted murder. Uh, instead of a life sentence, you got a 45 year sentence. Uh, you, you, your position is uh, you beat him, but you didn't shoot him. Well, the records suggest otherwise. Uh, the co defendant who you say did the shooting got 15 years less than what you got. Uh, and you've only served 19 years for a person who was murdered. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is uh, your substance abuse. Uh, you have taken uh, a, a few substance abuse programs that have to do with education. Uh, but my interview with you today tells me that you really have no concept of what your addiction really is. Uh, you, 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 you don't know anything about the 12 steps. You're willing to do AA. Uh, the Louisiana Parole Project is an excellent program. Excuse uh, me. And, and in my opinion, once you get uh, some long-term yeah. substance abuse treatment behind you while you've been in prison, that'd be a wonderful place for you to go to. I, I don't think that you're ready to do that just yet. I think that you need long-term substance abuse so you, number one, can understand your addiction and understand what what how to deal with, what tools that you can deal with those things. Uh, I've never taken Celebrate Recovery, although I do realize it's a faith-based program. But while it is a religious program, it is a program to help addicts. And that's something that you really could have used. And I think that, that 
you let the the religious part of you uh, override the fact that you need substance addiction treatment. I think you don't realize that yet, and I think you need more work. Uh, so my vote today, you do have support. You've got you've got you've got a lot going for you. But today, my vote is to deny. I believe you need more programs. Uh, I, I think that uh, you certainly need to to learn more about your addiction and how to deal with it. Uh, I think that 19 years, uh, even though you pled to an attempted murder, you got a 45 year sentence. I think that's just insufficient time. So that's my vote. For those reasons, my vote would be to deny. Mr. Roche. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I had this long, drawn out explanation, but it was the same explanation as Mr. Marabella. So for the same reasons, I deny your request. Thank you, Mr. Um, Mr. Thompson, I, I am encouraged uh, with the support that you have. You have every reason to leave this hearing and continue to do well. Uh, and, I, and I just want to make sure you understand that. And I urge you to reapply when you're eligible for a hearing. But, but for me, my vote is, is to deny as well, uh, primarily uh, the victim's opposition uh, that's been expressed at this hearing. Uh, but best wishes to you, so keep your head up. Continue to work hard and reapply when you're eligible for another hearing. Mr. Thompson, you've received three votes to deny, but but we all believe you're on the right track. So continue continue to work hard, and perhaps the next time it might be a little different. So good luck to you. Okay, thank you.
Many on parole is called back to order. The time is 1133. Our next case is Mr. Ian Kazanade. Uh, Mr. Kazanade, if you would please give us your full name and DOC number. Ian Kazanade, 255461. Thank you, Mr. Kazanade. Let me explain our process to you. Uh, first, I'm going to read some information into the record, and then we're going to conduct a parole interview with you. Uh, once we conduct that interview, we'll ask the warden for any input she might have uh, as to how you're doing while, while you're there. Uh, then we'll hear uh, those persons who wish to have input. Uh, Ms. Christy Sheremy with the Louisiana Permit <laughs> Project uh, is here on Zoom. Uh, Mr. Robert Lancaster, who is your attorney, Mr. Uh, Francis uh, Doan, am I pronouncing that correctly? Francis Don. Don, I'm sorry, sir, uh, is uh, also a law student working with Mr. Uh, Lancaster. Uh, Andrika DePlessis, your stepdaughter. Gabby DePlessis, your daughter's mother. Uh, and Tyrone Smith, who is with uh, First 72. Edward Casanave, your brother, will be speaking. Arian DePlessis, your daughter. And Jamie Jardina, uh, is present but not speaking. In opposition, we have Mr. Randy Meyer with the uh, Jefferson Parish District Attorney's Office. Yes, sir. Uh, after we hear all of those people and conduct an interview, you'll have an opportunity to address the board, say anything you'd like to do, and then we'll turn it over to Mr. La Lancaster, Mr. Dunn, and, and they will close out the case. Do you understand our process? Yes, sir. This is the matter of Ian Kazanave, DOC number 255461, date of birth, February the, uh, December the 4th of 1965. He's a third felony offender. He has a parole eligibility date of June the 7th of 2023, an adjusted good time date of June the 14th of 2081, and a full term date of April the 1st of 2097. Uh, he was uh, originally sentenced to life uh, he was uh, his sentence was commuted by Governor Edwards on June the seventh of twenty twenty three to ninety nine years, uh, and uh, is that information basically correct, uh, Mr. Casanay? Yes, sir. Mr. Casanay, your case has been assigned to Mr. Uh, Alvin Roche, who's sitting to my left, and he will begin our interview process. Would you please answer any questions he might have? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Professor Lancaster, we're yep. taking we are taking them younger and younger in law school. Mr. Don just looks young. Mr. Don, uh, Don just looks young, Mr. Roche, but he's fully ready and capable today. So, despite his, his youthful appearance, he's he's wise and capable. Great. Uh, good morning, Mr. Cassidy. How are you? Fine. Good. How have you been since the last time we saw each other? I've been pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Wise, we have Mr. Cassinet. He's 58 years old as of December 4th. Uh, is that correct? Yes, sir. And, and early happy birthday. Thank uh, you. He's a third felony offender. He's been incarcerated for the last 25 and a half years. He's on 345 days, good times. So tell us, Mr. Cassinate, what programs have you completed since your clemency hearing? I participated in a NAAA program, and upon completion of the program, I continue to still go to the meeting the weekends. Meetings. Okay. Any other good time programs since your clemency hearing? No, sir. Okay. Uh, tell me about any organizational participation, any community service that you've rendered since your hearings. I participated in the uh, over 40 basketball league as the stat guy for a couple of years. Good. Any other activities? That's about it. Okay. Uh, have you had any disciplinary write-up since you're here? No, sir. When was your last disciplinary write-up? In 2017. 
Okay, so so you had that right up in the last six years. No, not since then. Okay. Uh, tell us about your transition plan in Baton Rouge with Cindy Cassidy. Well, my transition uh, plan had changed since then. I'll be released to a local nursing home until my uh, family be able to find a full accountability for me till I get out. And what nursing home is that? We're not sure yet. It's River Oaks. River Oaks. River Oaks, okay. So basically, you're going to take, uh, will you be physically able to attend sessions with the Louisiana Pro Project? Yes, so I take programs uh, with the Louisiana Pro Project to uh, help me transition into society. Okay. And, and you have no problem with transportation back and forth to the Louisiana Pro Project? No, sir. Um, tell me about your sobriety plan uh, and tell us exactly what you plan to do to keep your, your, your sobriety. Well, my sobriety plan is to continue to participate in a, uh, NAAA meetings. Uh, should I be granted my release? And um, I recognize the importance of having the community of backbone behind me also. Do you realize the importance of having a sponsor, a person that you can rely upon uh, to yes. uh, give you uh, advice when you get into a stressful situation? Yes, sir. Have you identified anybody as yet? Um, well, um, upon um, going to the programs, you know, I'll find some, uh, I have some community help with the guys in in the program. I'm almost sure Louisiana Road Project can help you with that. Yes, sir. Uh, one, uh, Ambo, would you like to have any input, remarks, or observations? Uh, yes. I just want to uh, clarify something that we have an application in with River Oaks for him. Uh, okay. With his pending. Okay. Um, and and so we, we're going to do a release directly to the nursing home. Yes, sir. Okay. Like I say, it's pending. We're waiting on, the, uh, on their approval. Oh, it's pending. It's okay. Okay. Is that so, um, go ahead, Ms. Roche. You go ahead, Warden. Oh, okay. So uh, um, he was being truthful. He had substance abuse, 100 hour of uh, pre release, victim awareness, anger management. He did parenting skills. His tiger is low. He's a medium custody, and uh, he's assigned to Ash 2, um, which is a, a, a a, a dorm that we do care for uh, people that need, um, a, you know, healthcare artists to help uh, attend to their needs and stuff. Um, he also is in uh, his GED. He's trying to obtain his GED. And that's it. Okay. So he's in the GED program currently? Uh, yes, sir. And is there any. Um, Projected time when you go complete and pass that final examination? Oh, they didn't give us a time. No, he's just, it's just got president enrolled. Okay. He's been, taking, he's been in and out because of medical reasons. So, um, you know, I don't know if it's going to be, he's able to obtain it before he's released due to the fact that he's been taken in and out due to medical. Okay. Thank you, Juan. You're welcome. Mr. Kassanek. Yes, sir. How are you doing in the high set programs? I'm doing 
pretty good. I'm struggling a little bit with Matt, but uh, I'm doing pretty good. Have you taken any of the uh, subject area tests? No, not yet. I just recently uh, got in school again. I was able to reapply. Okay. It's very important that you achieve that GED. It helps a lot with your um, confidence. It's a confidence builder. It's something that you have to achieve and it builds your confidence in every phase of your life. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Now we'll hear from uh, those people uh, in support. Uh, Ms. Uh, Christy Sheremy. Christy Sheremy, representing Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, we are fully aware and prepared uh, for Mr. Ian's um, the, the, the pending of River Oaks, the approval. We are uh, fully prepared to send a caseworker to visit him to provide all services that are applicable to Mr. Ian. Um, we will make sure that uh, any and all treatment plans um, that, that we can provide or that uh, is applicable to him, we will have a case worker visiting him weekly to check on him and provide any and all services. And we just wanted the board to know that we are definitely uh, fully support him and throughout his transition uh, due to him, his circumstances, we just find it would be easier just to go to him rather than bringing him to us. Thank you very much, ma'am. Now we're here for Mr. Uh, Edward Casanave, uh, Mr. Casanave's brother. Sir, you're on mute. Could you unmute your microphone? Still can't hear you. Muted from the out. There you outside. go. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Name, so good morning, sir. Still. Yes, I'm on the East Coast. I'm in. I'm oh, in okay. Dallas. All right. Well, good afternoon. <laughs> right in Dallas, Georgia. And uh, I thank you all for having the opportunity here for me to speak on behalf of my family and my brother and those who are speaking today. Uh, we look forward for him to have the possible opportunity to be paroled to continue his life, you know, outside of the institution and to uh, reestablish himself with family that's here to support him. As I said, I live here in Dallas, Georgia. My daughter, Cindy, who you spoke of earlier, her and her family are viewing as well right now, and they have just recently moved here to Georgia as well. So he has a supporting cast here as well in Georgia, as well as, you know, those in Louisiana that are reaching out to help him. But we look forward to it, and uh, we hope you find that, you know, you all would be able to give him this opportunity to have a new lease on life. He has a daughter and a granddaughter as well. And I mean, it would just be a blessing to have that kind of family around him and care for him and help him along in life and love on him. We truly miss him. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate your comments. Now we'll hear uh, Mr. Uh, Casanave is, uh, well, sorry, Mr. Randy Meyer. We'll hear the opposition. Mr. Meyer. Good morning, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA Jefferson Parish. Um, my opposition at this point is is based on he had he committed his own robbery uh he was given a life sentence the pardon board recommended to the governor and the governor signed the commutation of the sentence which was 99 years plus with parole eligibility after 30 years and my calculation is 30 years wouldn't be to roughly 2029 so he's not quite at that point that that both the board and the governor uh, initially um, proposed. Additionally, uh, I'm, I'm concerned with the lack of programming. The only programs he's had since he's been incarcerated, um, <clears throat> from what I'm seeing in the record, uh, was the pre-release and living in balance, both one and two. Um, and, and that was only in 2016. He's had nothing since. Uh, he said he, he has completed NAAA, according to his testimony, which I think is a good thing. I was I was going to suggest that he needed something like that. Uh, and um, continuing with a, a, a plan based on uh, 
based on continuing to go to NA, NA and AA meetings would be very uh, important for him. Um, uh, I think I understood his brother to say they would like him to go live in Georgia. Um, I don't know if he's done an out-of-state compact or not. Um, I would I would be less likely to oppose if he was going to Georgia. But uh, at this time, being here in Louisiana due to the lack of programs uh, and um, – in, in my thoughts, he's not quite eligible as of yet because 30 years hasn't run. We'd be opposed to his request. Thank you, Mr. Myers. We appreciate your comments. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Myers, the Pond Board recommendation was to commute to 99 years with no eligibility after 30 years. And that was the actual uh, terms when the governor signed the commutation of sentence. But as right. soon as the governor signed the commutation of sentence, it was superseded by Act 122, because his sentence had been commuted a number of years, he was eligible at the survey 20 years. And he had served 25 years. So 120, Act 122 was in effect. So therefore, the governor's commutation was superseded by that. I understand that, but I, I still felt that I, and still feel that the board had recommended 30 and the governor said 30, and that's still a, a huge benefit to him based on a life sentence. Yeah. So notwithstanding Act 122, um, the fact that the board and the governor both said after 30 years, I think is, is something that, that we should stand by. And that's, that's a legislative matter and the law has to be changed and uh, as far as the law in the state of Louisiana now, no, no. that Act 122 supersedes uh, a commutation of sentence. Okay. okay. Uh, Mr. Casanave, is there anything you'd like to say before we turn it over to Mr. Dunn? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to apologize to Ms. Robinson and her family for the bad decision that, that I made. I've been praying for their family for the last 25 years since that act was committed. I regret all the bad choices I made and the acts of my past. And I ask the family that if there's any hope, could they forgive me? Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Dunn? Yes, sir. Uh, may it please the committee, Mr. Ian Kasnay comes before this honorable committee respectfully requesting early release on parole. Mr. Kasnay is no longer the drug user that he once was. He has taken full accountability and has shown deep remorse for the heinous crime that he has committed. He has taken programs that have helped prepare him for release, programming such as anger management, victims awareness, living in balance, NA and AA 12-step program. He has learned to think of the consequences before he acts. He has also learned to um, control his emotions, especially when stressed. He has also learned to understand his stressors and how to avoid contentious situations. Furthermore, through Living in Balance, um, NA, AA 12-step program and faith-based programs, he has developed a sobriety plan that will allow him to have success upon release. Mr. Kasnay will not be a threat to public society. His health is rapidly declining. Um, during his incarceration, he has had 15 hospitalizations, um, five of them that have occurred since the clemency, with two of them occurring um, since the law uh, clinic's representation in August of this year. Um, his his medical condition is um, also causes him to go receive medical treatments every two weeks at the University Medical Center in New Orleans. And he also has to, um, due to recent um, vascular surgery, he is also required to have medical checkups every two weeks, which heavily limits the amount of programming and also limits the amount of time that he could spend dedicating himself to his GED. Um, as noted in his re-entry plan, um, Mr. Kasnay will be released to uh, River Oats, where, which is a uh, nursing home, which will be able to accommodate his medical needs and the uh, 
Louisiana Pro Project will be able to facilitate the transfer from um, LSP to River Oats in the future. And um, it also must be noted that uh, the Pro Project will also assist with um, assist Mr. Kazanev in, um, in setting up Medicaid and also setting up programs such as SNAP, uh, Supplemental Security Income, and Social Security um, Disability Insurance. Uh, for these foregoing reasons, we request that Mr. Kazanev be granted parole today for whatever condition the committee deems fitting. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Well done. Well done. Uh, Ms. Roche, the panel, the red panel right there? Yes. Okay. Mr. Cassidy, you have been read by the governor of the state of Louisiana a commutation of sentence, nine, nine years with royal eligibility after 30 years. Based upon Act 122, once the governor signs that commutation of sentence, you are eligible under that act. And that act says if you have a number of years sentence and have served 20 years, you are eligible for parole. Based on positive remarks from Warren Ambo and a good transition plan, I grant your request and you are to be released to the River Oaks Nursing Home. Conditions after release, you must attend uh, by Zoom or physically attend <clears throat> three NAAA meetings a week and all other conditions of your parole will be at the direction of your parole office. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Thank Lynch. you, Sue. Uh, uh, Ms. Ian, my vote is the same for the same reasons. I wish you well. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Kazanave, I agree with my colleagues. My vote likewise would be the same uh, for the same reasons. So good luck to you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.
Committee on Parole is called back to order. The time is uh, 12 o'clock uh, noon. Uh, our next case is Mr. Uh, Herbert Pierre. Is that correct, Mr. Uh, Pierre? Yes, yes, sir. On some of the papers, it says Bear, but is it Herbert, H-E-R-B-E-R-T? It's Herbert. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, our next case is Mr. Herbert Pierre. Uh, Mr. Pierre, let me explain to you uh, what our process is. Uh, first off, let me ask you if you would introduce yourself and give us your DOC number. I'm Herbert Pierre. My DOC number is 321310. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me explain our process to you. Uh, first, I'm going to read some information into the record. Then we're going to conduct a parole interview with you. Then we'll ask Lord Nambo to give us any input she might have regarding you and your case. Uh, and then we'll listen to uh, those who wish to have input. Uh, currently today, uh, here in favor of your uh, parole is Miss uh, Christy Sheremy, which is, uh, she is with the Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, Mr. Lancaster, who is uh, an attorney uh, here representing you, as well as Ms. Charlize Waters, uh, Walters, I'm sorry, Walters, who is a, a student, a law student, who will likewise be representing you, and your uh, niece, Ms. Arian Scott, will be here present and uh, working with you. Uh, also is Ms. Adrienne Hutchinson. Mr. Randy Meyer is here as well from the Jefferson Parish District Attorney's Office in opposition. Uh, once we hear all of these people and have a hearing, uh, you'll have an opportunity to say whatever you'd like to say to the board. Then we'll allow your lawyers to close out before we vote. Do you understand our process, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. This is uh, the matter of Mr. Herbert Pierre. DOC number 321310, date of birth, October the 9th of 1963. He's classified as a third felony offender with a parole eligibility date of August the 1st of 2021. He has an adjusted good time date of, of November the 7th of 2079, a full term date of July the 3rd of 2080. He is currently serving uh, an 80 year sentence on the charges of simple burglary of an inhabited dwelling and armed robbery after having been adjudicated a habitual offender. Uh, Mr. Uh, Pierre, is that information all sound correct? Yes, sir. Uh, your case has been assigned to Mr. Roche. Mr. Roche will begin our questioning. Would you please answer any questions he might have? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Pierre. How are you? All right, sir, how are you? Good. Mr. Pierre, you're 60 years old, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you're a third felony offender, and you've earned 240 days good time. Yes, sir. That's my right? Yes, sir. So tell me why an offender who's been incarcerated for 23 years only earned 240 days good time. Well, tell sir. Tell me about the programs. When I first arrived here um, at Angola, there weren't a lot of programs open to a person that had an excessive amount of time as I did and didn't have a solution to being released. So I couldn't get the programs that I, that I wish I had or would have gotten. So. Okay. I've heard that explanation quite a number of times in the last eight years. Um, you had a hearing, this is a re-hearing, your last hearing was on January 21st, 2022, about 22 months ago. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And the reasons why you were denied is you needed additional programs. Uh, you have a fair institutional record. And that's been upgraded since your last hearing to good law enforcement opposition, and your extensive criminal history. And on June 8th, 2023, you were granted a new hearing. Is that correct? Excuse me, sir. I didn't understand the question. On June 8th, 2023, you were granted a rehearing. Yes, sir. Okay. So tell me about the programs that you've completed since your last hearing. 
Well, I've taken victim awareness and as victim something. Uh, victim accountability. accountability. Yes, ma'am. Victim accountability. I've taken those courses uh, and they helped me uh, learn more about the variety and the, the, the range and extent to the victims in my case. In other words, I didn't have just one victim. I have okay. multiple victims. Sir, sir, sir. Okay. Now, what other programs have you completed since I, you left here? I wound up taking the the uh the one hundred hours pre release course again. I had that too. Okay. So the only two good time classes in the last twenty two months. Yes, sir. Thank okay. You. Are you a trustee? Yes, sir, I am. Which level? I'm a class C trustee. And how long have you been a class C trustee? I obtained my class C trustee approximately one week after my last hearing. So about a year and a half. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what's your current job assignment? My current job assignment, um, I'm a librarian. I've been a librarian since about 2009. So you've been in the main prison library for the last 14 years? No, sir. I was at the main prison library up until about 2018, and then I work, I'm work. i working at the Camp D library currently. Okay, so you've been in the library at Camp D or the main prison library for the last 14 years? Yes, sir. Okay, so 2009, 2013, 14 years? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, tell me exactly what your job is in the library. Working as a librarian, I uh, assist inmates in basically learning how to read and acquire knowledge that they would have a hard time getting. I also assist the uh, some of the physically impaired. I, I aid them in getting information and stuff that they need. I've had guys that I can say are problematic. They couldn't read or they want to learn to read. And I would start them off at a low level scholastic entrance. In other words, I would find something. I'd ask them, I was like, uh, what are your interests? And I'd find something that interests them. And I find the lowest galactic level I could find and get so, in so, so, reading. So, Mr. Pierre, you're a library slash tutor. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. It's just that it would it's easier for me. They find it easier to uh communicate with me than a some tutors are judgmental. I'm not judgmental. They want to learn, I'm gonna help them. Okay. And when okay. they approach me with it, you know. How many books do you have in your library? About 4,000. Do you use the Library of Congress or the Dewey classification? Sir? Which classification do you use? The Library of Congress classification or the oh. Dewey mode classification? It's the, basically the Library of Congress. Okay. The same Dewey Decimal System. Okay. You're talking to a 40 year librarian, so that I had <laughs> uh yeah, Miss Miss Linda Holmes, uh she trained us and the way she said and the way she does it is is according to the way it goes. Um oh, I, I understand. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about any vocational skills that you have that you could use for employment if you're released. Uh that is one of the vocational skills that I can use for employment if I'm released, because uh, that is something I want to maintain is, a, is, is an access to knowledge and an access to help people to learn knowledge. So that's why I, I mainly stay focused with that. And again, when I first come here, programs like that weren't, weren't, uh, Mr. Pierre, mm -hmm. What type of employment are you looking for if you're released? Okay. Uh, the employment I'm looking for is general laborer, 
uh, maintenance, anything that's doing dealing with uh, constructive purposes. Yeah, that's why I asked you about your vocation. Do you have any vocational skills in carpentry, plumbing, uh, friendly no, house, plumbing? No, sir. No, sir. So how are you going to work in construction? Those projects, those programs were not uh, were not available to us when when I first arrived. And yes. were you employed at the time you were incarcerated? Yes, sir. What were you doing? I was a utility hand offshore. Okay. Any, any thoughts about going back offshore? If at all at my age, I wouldn't mind. I would enjoy it actually because it would give me a chance to work in a field that I already know. Y'all are 60 years old, Mr. Uh, Pierre. I, 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 That's the I'll, young thing. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's talk about drugs and alcohol. If you ever been addicted to illegal drugs or alcohol? Drugs, no, sir. Alcohol, yes. Okay. You've never used any illegal drugs? No, sir. Marijuana? No, sir. Okay. Those so kind of drugs. Me, so tell me when you started drinking alcohol. I started drinking alcohol at about, I would say, six to seven years old. Being around my dad, I would, uh, as a kid, I wanted to be like my dad. I was, I started drinking his drinks. And when did you become an alcoholic? I did not realize, I can honestly say that all through my teen years, I was drinking and I was drinking heavily, maybe because of peer pressure, maybe because of enjoyment, I'm not sure, but I didn't realize I was an alcoholic until I was one year sober in the parish. How old were you then? 37, I think 36, 37. So you started drinking at five or six years old, and didn't come to the realization that you were an alcoholic until you were 37. Yes, sir. So at 37, what did you do about your problem? Well, at the time, I couldn't do much of anything because I was in the parish jail. It's when I got here, I was I had access to the I couldn't get into the programs, but I had access to the material. And I started learning more and more of what cause my alcoholism and what I can do about my alcoholism. Okay, so tell me what programs have you completed in your uh, 23 years of incarceration to deal with your alcohol problem? <laughs> Relapse prevention. Uh, it was offered to me and I thought that was, to be honest, the guy name was Shane. To be honest, I thought that was a blessing because... Mr. Pierre, I, mm -hmm. Mr. Pierre answer my question directly. Mm -hmm. I don't need as much narrative as you would like to give me. Mm -hmm. So just answer my questions and... Yes, sir. Good. So, so you took relapse, prevention, what else? Thank you for a change. That's not a substance abuse. No, but it it it, it applies to substance abuse because it allows me to think before I even thinking about you abusing, right. you know, going back to drinking or anything. You're exactly right. What up what are other substance abuse education or treatment have you completed? I hadn't completed any, but I had uh, a a plan in place. If I was to go to the uh, parole project, if, if I was granted parole and I'm at the parole project, I intend on enrolling in, uh, it's a two weeks alcohol anonymous program. And uh, once once from there, when I get home, the alcohol, the, you know, programs that I can attend at twice a week to go there. Mr. Pierre, I'm almost sure this came up at your last hearing about your alcohol problem, and you've had 22 months to enroll in a program to start treating your addiction, and you have not. They do not offer it at the camp where I'm at. 
Okay. Uh, the victims in this offense had no comment. They could not be located. So let's talk about your programs. Okay, one second. Let me get to that page. Mm -hmm. Now, according to a program listing dated October 24th, 2023, only three weeks ago, you, you've completed 100 hours pre-release, anger management, thank you for a change, and victim awareness. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Oh, and relapse prevention. It's, it's not on here, but okay, that is the only substance abuse education that you've had in the last 23 years. Yes, sir. Okay. And let's see what we're going to talk about next. So let's talk about um, your institutional record. When's the last disciplinary write-up that you had? I believe it was November or December 2018. Okay. According to your Institutional record, you've been convicted of three violent offenses. You have, uh, let's see. You've completed your probation, parole preparation. You have an employment plan. And your residency is at, at Radcliffe Street in Marrero, Louisiana. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Can you tell me exactly uh, who you'll be living with and where you'll be in Florida? Um, I'll be living with my oldest sister. Her name is Kathy Taylor. Uh, she lives on, at, I don't remember that number, but it's on Radcliffe Street. I'll be staying with her. Uh, where I'll be employed is my my one of my nieces. She's a real estate agent, and I'll be working for her. In Harvard, Louisiana? Yes, sir. Okay. You're in minimum custody, you have a low risk assessment, and you have seven disciplinary write ups in 23 years of incarceration. That's shot back. Uh, you have a high school diploma. Where, where, where from? Old Perry Walker Senior High School. It's on the West Bank of New Orleans. Or it was on the West Bank of New Orleans. I know exactly where, where it is. So tell me why I should vote to release you with almost 60 years left on your sentence. Now you, now you can talk. <laughs> No, nah, I can't actually. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I understand the crime I committed, and I am remorseful for committing it. At the time that I did commit the crime, I wasn't thinking in my right mind. Um, being sole provider, and I had a good job, don't get me wrong, but when the bills started coming up and the debt started coming up, I wasn't thinking rationally. Now, after, as you say, with almost 60 years uh, left on my sentence, I've learned to, uh, in, other, in other words, I have the better tools, what I'm trying to say. I have better, I have a better support system to where I know I can be successful out there. I have, uh, a reentry plan to continue my sobriety uh, through support of family. And, you know, I've been working hard. And you said that the victim had nothing to say or whatever. Um, I owe 
in my opinion, I owe society for my actions. And if I'm released today, I can show that even though I was wrong, and I, I, I really am truly, I was really and truly wrong, I can show or be progressive in society to try to prevent others from following, going along that path. Tell me about the issue in Natchitoches, uh, Natchez, Mississippi. You have a warrant, an active warrant yes, in Natchez, Mississippi. Tell me about that. Well, it was I. I, I'm a, I had a misconception of it. I thought it was dismissed. Apparently, it wasn't dismissed, and uh, I didn't learn about it till I got here. So, but I am responsible, and I would like the opportunity to go and face that charge. Uh, you've been on supervision three times. How did you do? I completed them. You say I've been on supervision. Okay. I, I completed them. You completed them, but unsuccessfully. Two of them were terminated unsatisfactorily, and one was terminated satisfactorily. So why were they terminated unsatisfactorily? Well, right now, um. First one was a federal probation. Right. I completed that. I remember that. I completed that. That was a federal probation. And I had a probation in the state under an aggravated battery. And as far as I knew, again, I was under the conception that I completed that as well. So I okay. Started. okay. Actually, actually, both of the records are not available. It says they, they, they couldn't tell whether they were unsatisfactory or satisfactory. And I saw unsatisfactory, but it was, information was not available. It goes back to 1987 and 1989, and information was unavailable. But the one in 1995, uh, you did terminate satisfactory. Yes, sir. Okay. We have opposition. From law enforcement in Jefferson Parish, we have opposition from the DA's office in Jefferson Parish. So, Ward Ambo, yes. do you have any remarks, observations, comments? I have, I have nothing else to say. I think that you and Mr. Pierre covered exactly everything that's in this chart. Thank you, Ward. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman, I have one question. Okay. Mr. Pierre, uh, the, the records I have show that you have 14 years of education. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Tell us about that. Well, I graduated high school and... A year, went, what year class of what? Uh, 81. Class of 81, okay. And I went to college for... Where? Two, Where did you go to college? Suno in New Orleans. Okay. And what did you major in? I was I was pre-majoring in aeronautical engineering. But sorry, it kind of broke uh, up. Though. Say it again. What were you majoring in? I was pre-majoring in aeronautical engineering. I was taking my basics so I could go to engineering school. But because of my responsibilities to the family as a, as a provider in the family, I could no longer finish school. So you did two years at SUNO? Yes, ma'am. All right. I um I have in my notes. I, I know Mr. Roche said he said he uh, did see it, and I can't find it in the file. But I have in my notes that the victim had taken no position, but yes. you did the crime impacted her life. Uh, she said that it caused her some anxiety and it was affecting her in her job performance as a bank teller. And I just wanted to put that on the record and express that. There's nothing you can do about it, but I wanted it on the, on the record. But she did have, she took no position as to release. Uh, 
That's all I had, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Warren. You're welcome. Now we'll hear from uh, Ms. Christy Sheremy. Christy with Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, we fully support Mr. Pierre if, um, if he is granted providing all of the services that we provide to all of our clients, uh, making sure that he is um, given a mental health evaluation by our on-staff social worker, making sure that he is connected with any AA Zoom meetings that he needs to continue on with um, his sobriety, uh, dealing with the alcoholism. And um, it is noted that Mr. Pierre will be a short-term client um, so after completing the program successfully, he will be residing in Marrero with his sister and also where he has the opportunity of employment um, with Miss Scott. And so we just wanted to make sure that the board was aware that we do support him and will provide any and all services um, to Ms. P Mr. Uh, Pierre upon his release, if granted. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sherry. Uh, now we hear from uh, your niece, Ms. Ariane Scott. Good morning, board. My name is Ariane Scott. Um, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today on behalf of my uncle. Um, I want to express that I am here uh, fully and have been since the age of 15. I have supported my uncle uh, with uplifting spirits as just a young girl of writing letters. I am happy and very emotional, excuse me, um, to be put in a place to provide what he needs. Um, have a job for him. He will be a porter groundskeeper 40 hours a week. I'm a tough boss. He won't have it easy. I can promise you that. Um, I have an approval from my supervisor that if in one year he is able to prove that he will pass the AC certification to be an AC certified tech his fair housing training um, to be able to deal with clients and tenants as well. He will be granted a free apartment of no charge to live on our senior property because I do manage seniors. And he's a senior now, uh, even though you guys think he's still kind of young. He is a senior, so um, he will be able to be with his peers. Um, I personally have a program for reacclimating gentlemen and women that are coming from prisons to be Reacclimated into the world, and it's my passion. 95% of the people I hire have been in prison, and I enjoy helping them uh, starting a new life. Everybody deserves a second chance in life is what I feel if you are remorseful, if you understand your crimes, if you understand what it takes to be a better person. And um, I am prepared to be with him every step of the way with his sobriety. Um, understand the importance of his sobriety. And we want him to be able to fellowship with family and God again, um, help me raise my babies. Um, it means a lot that we're doing this today. Um, I pray um, everything does go in his favor. I appreciate everything. I am literally at your disposal, whatever you need, whatever you need me to provide. Um, my company, Rampart, we are formerly known as Ladder and Bloom. We are a very prominent uh, company in Louisiana. And I, I, I literally travel all over the world to help people in his position. And I'm very honored to be able to offer that to my family. Um, so again, forgive me. I'm a crybaby. Okay. You guys listening to me today. And if you do grant his release, I will work him to the bone. He won't have anything else to do but to be a good person, to right his wrongs, and to end out the, less, the rest of his days the way he should. Thank, Thank you, you very much. For, Thank you very much, Mr. Scott. Uh, now we'll hear from uh, Mr. Randy Meyer, the opposition. Mr. Meyer. Good afternoon, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA in Jefferson Parish. Um, we're opposed to Mr. Pierre at this point. Um, he was convicted of an armed robbery, sentenced to 80 years without benefits, um, and is currently parole eligible, but he's, you know, the 80 year sentence, he's only served 20 of those, roughly 20 years. Um, 
I would think there's insufficient time, sir. Looking back at his history since 86 to 2000, he had about 12 arrests. Um, and uh, you know, I think a lot of times people continue doing that because there's no consequences to their actions. Uh, and I think that is in part why Mr. Pierre is where he is today. At his last parole hearing in 2022, he was told to have additional programs. Since that time, he's only had victim awareness and victim letter writing. Um, the only programs he's taken were in 2017 and 19, basically pre-release anger management and thinking for a change. I, I think he definitely needs some additional programs in order to uh, have him prepared for an eventual release. Um, and, and looking at uh, his prior record while under supervision, uh, it's not that good. Um, a couple of unsuccessful uh, terms under supervision. So if those reasons were opposed to his request. Thank you, Mr. Mayo. Uh, Mr. Pierre, is there anything you'd like to say before we turn it over to your attorney? I'd like to say that uh, I thank the board for this opportunity to appear before you. And uh, I am truly remorseful for the things that I did. Uh, I learned that my crime, it went beyond just one victim. It, it's, it's like an old saying, uh, a man and a woman can have a child, but it takes a nation to raise them. Well, a man can commit a crime, but a nation will, a nation will suffer. And I truly understand and hope that someday that I can show that, you know, how remorseful I am for, for my action. That's all. Thank you very much. Ms. Walters, you want to close it out for us? Good morning. I want to first thank the committee for allowing me to be president and speak on behalf of Mr. Uh, Herbert Pierre. Um, Mr. Pierre had the opportunity to come before the committee on January of last year. And Ms. Wise, you actually served on the panel. And after watching the recording, I understood why he was denied. But today, Mr. Pierre comes before the board ready to be released. At his last hearing, he was asked to do more programming and to maintain his good conduct. And he has done that. He immediately after the hearing, he was upgraded to um, a higher trustee status. He completed victim awareness and victim accountability, accountability letter training. And in doing so, he understood, as he's um, said before, the impact that it had on not just the victim, but everyone around. Um, he often recounts uh, seeing it firsthand with his family as he watched his niece have to um, endure something that he put, that he committed against someone else. So I do know that the remorse is there and he has um, constantly repeated that. Um, he has completed 100 hours of pre-release refresher course and that just basically reinforced his knowledge. Uh, uh, and he had the money management, financial responsibility. He understands that when he's released and the stress that he had before could be a possibility, but through the programming he's had here at um, LSP, he's been able to um, counteract that and he became vice president of the SOC club, that's the social orientation club, as well as the treasurer. And it's difficult to maintain just the position of vice president, but he's also gained the trust to be able to be um, to be accountable for others' monies, which, which I think is a really important role. And it does show and document the trust that not only uh, does some inmates have for him, but his officers as well. Um, also, he uh, has hosted things like bingo night. Um, he, he always talks about the bingo night, which he um, has been able to build a relationship and a bridge between the inmates and the officers, which speaks to his character as well. And as his role as a librarian, uh, he has been able to build a connection with the inmates and learn them beyond just what he sees on the surface level to cater to their needs as far as being able to educate them, which is a difficult task, but a task he's always ready to um, endure. And if he's granted release, he will seek uh, Alcoholic Anonymous 
group here with a uh, parole project. And he will maintain that he goes two weeks, at least twice, well, twice a week. And then he'll also continue that pattern when he's um, able to go to New Orleans. And there in New Orleans, as Miss Ariane said, he will have a position there. And he has so much love and support from his family. And they'll, they'll ensure that he continues on the straight and narrow, as well as Mr. Pierre himself. Uh, he has done the work. He has done, um, I think, an adequate amount of time to where he has been able to uh, be remorseful and accept his um, the responsibility that he needs. And uh, as far as his uh, programming, while he has, hasn't done that much programming in the last year, I think his roles that he has in the clubs that he's in, the role that he has as librarian, does show the trust and speaks to his accountability as an individual. And as well as his vocational training, he hasn't mentioned it, but Mr. Pierre is smart. He's really good in engineering. And I think he does have the foundation that will set him up for a pretty successful future if he is granted parole. And for those reasons and the reasons that Mr. Pierre stated, I um, do ask the board or request from the board that he be granted parole with any conditions that you guys seem or deem appropriate. Thank you. Very good, uh, Ms. Walters. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh, very, very good. Is the board ready to vote? Yes. Okay. Mr. Roche? Mr. Pierre. Sir. You have a very serious disease. And you didn't recognize that disease until you were 37 years old. What concerns me, that disease is untreated. We have not taken appropriate substance abuse education or treatment to address that. And I would be derelict in my duty to release you with that disease, and you become a danger to public safety. Alcoholism is one of the most prolific disease that causes death in this country. And I will not release you untreated. So based upon a need for additional program, especially substance abuse, and I will specify this time, need for additional program, especially substance abuse education and treatment based on law enforcement opposition, the DA's office is strongly opposed you have an extensive criminal history, and I think insufficient time served on the original sentence. I deny your request. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Ms. Wise? Uh, Mr. Pierre, uh, uh, to your niece, I, first I want to thank you for hiring returning citizens. I always want to cheer somebody. You said 95% of your staff are, are returning citizens, and I applaud you for that. <laughs> I appreciate that, and I appreciate your participation today. Uh, Mr. Pierre, I, I, I do see you a little different from last time. Uh, my vote is to grant uh, this time. You, you do have a good institutional record. Uh, you do have a, a positive uh, and a very good transition, transition plan, the Louisiana Parole Project, and uh, with your niece. Uh, and, and for me, it's because you like victim opposition uh, that, that that says a lot for me. And I would like for you to, you know, to cooperate with the, the plans as per the Louisiana Parole Project. Um, but that release is after you complete a long-term substance abuse program. The release is conditional. After you complete a long-term substance abuse program, then go to, go to uh, Louisiana Parole Project followed by your niece. But I'm just one vote and that's my vote. Uh, best wishes to you, sir. Thank you. Uh... So, uh, Mr. Pierre, uh, I've, I've listened intently, and, and I agree with both of my colleagues about their assessment. Uh, I, I lean more towards Ms. Wise on your long-term treatment, 
Uh, my vote would be to grant conditionally upon your completing the long-term uh, substance abuse program in the Department of Corrections, primarily Steve Hoyle, uh, something uh, significant like that. And then uh, if you're able to do that within nine months, you'll be released to the Louisiana Parole Project to follow all of their recommendations for three AA meetings per week. Uh, that would be my vote. So you have two votes to grant and one vote to deny. Yeah. Okay. So your uh, parole has been conditionally granted today. Uh, you will be required to complete a long-term substance abuse program. Once you complete that program, you will go, go work with the Louisiana Parole Project uh, and do at least three AA meetings per week and follow whatever recommendations the Louisiana Parole Project makes to you, as well as everything your parole officer tells you. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.
Committee on Parole is called back to order. The time is 12.50. Our next case is Mr. Thomas Schmokey. Mr. Schmokey, would you please give us your full name and DOC number? Thomas Schmokey, 34-2286. Mr. Schmokey, let me explain to you our process first. I'm going to read some information into the record, and we're going to conduct a parole interview with you, and we'll ask the warden if she has any input as to how you're doing, while, where you are, uh, and we'll listen to uh, anyone who has uh, input they'd like to speak. Uh, your brother uh, is on Zoom with us, Mr. Frankie Schmokey. He is uh, president and will be speaking. Uh, once we conduct that hearing, you'll have an opportunity to say whatever you'd want to say to the board, then we'll vote. You understand our process? Yes. This is the matter of Thomas J. Schmokey, uh, DOC number 34226-2286, date of birth June 24th of 1976. He's a third felony offender. He is... Uh, He's serving a life sentence on the charges of simple burglary, illegal possession of stolen things, and simple burglary and theft after having been adjudicated a habitual offender. Uh, is that information, Mr. Schmokey, basically correct? Yes, sir. Uh, your case has been assigned to Mr. Alvin Roche. Would you please answer any questions he might have? Good afternoon, Mr. Schmokey. How are you? Doing fine, a little nervous. A little nervous, I can see it. But sit back, relax, and we're going to have a conversation, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Smokey, you're currently 47 years old. You're a third felony offender, and you're sentenced as an habitual offender with theft, $500 or more, and you were sentenced to life. Is that correct? Yes, sir. You have an extensive criminal history, and you haven't done very well on supervision. So tell me what was going on. Uh, I was just growing up, sir, and got with the wrong people and uh, made wrong decisions. And doing those little things got you in big trouble. Yes, sir. Now, what have you done to rehabilitate yourself? I've taken every class that was offered to me. I've uh, tried to do a little uh, rehabilitation on my own in the dorms and stuff with other inmates. Now, Mr. Smokey, how long have you been incarcerated? Uh, 19 and a half years. 19 and a half years, and 12 months ago, you got a write-up. Yes, sir. And you were sent to segregated quarters. It was serious enough that you were sent to segregated quarters for contraband. What was the contraband? A uh, failed drug test, sir. And... Five months before that, in 2022, you got another contraband. What was that contraband? Possession of drugs. Now, I will tell you quite frankly, I understand your sentence and I understand your predicament, but I can't vote for you today because you're still committing disciplinary write-ups, very serious disciplinary write-ups. You have a drug problem. You need to talk to the one, sister one, and see what you can do about that. You have an extensive criminal background. You do poor supervision. You even do poorly incarcerate. It's time to get the train on, the train on the tracks, and get, get everything straight. So the next time you appear before this board, you'll be right up free. You'll have substance abuse treatment, and you'll have some ammunition for us to consider releasing you. Warden, would you like to add anything? Um, I agree uh, with you, Mr. Roche, uh, that we're going to come up with a plan for him to have more, more programming and more treatment uh, and stuff to try to conquer his drug, uh, drug habits and stuff. 
So I think you need more programming. They froze. Big time. Can't, I can't, can't do it. Well, at least we know the I hope we know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's good. Y'all yeah, can talk to this uh, computer. Mr. Mayor uh, Bell. Computer is she can hear you. Warren, can you hear us? Mm -hmm. We can't hear you, though. Oh, God. There we go. Now we can. Now we can. Now we can. Can you hear me now? We're apparently out. Are we out? Can, can you not see us? I cannot see y'all at all. We're here, so we're going to continue on. Uh, uh, Without uh, just without being able to see us. Okay, so uh, I re repeat what I was uh, saying to Mr. Roche about Mr. Smokey's uh, drug uh, problem. I think that he do need more programming, uh, and we would suggest that he go into uh, some type of substance abuse long term care. Um, so we, we had heard that part of it. Uh, okay. Mr. Wise has a question of Mr. Smoke. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? Here. Can you hear me? Uh, no, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I saw the record where you had been enrolled in victim awareness and then you got removed due to excessive absence. Uh, speak to that. What was going on? Uh, that, that's when I caught, got that write up for the contraband, ma'am, and they moved me to another camp. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. I understand that. I understand. That's all I had, Jim. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from your brother, uh, Frank, Frankie Schmokey. I, I don't know if we still have him on. But, uh, there, there you are. Okay. Smokey, can you hear me? Mr. Frankie Smokey, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, if you'll introduce yourself, sir, and tell us what you'd like us to know about your brother. Um, I was just going to say that uh, I'm prepared that if he is paroled to uh, take on the responsibilities of making sure that he does what he's supposed to do, attend AA meetings, um, get him back on his feet to where he is not offending. Thank you, Mr. Snoopy. Lucky to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Thomas Snoopy. Yes, sir. Would you like to say to the board before we vote? Uh, since I have gotten the contraband write-ups, I have been in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, which is the only thing offered to me right now. And I have been write-up free and drug-free since then. Thank you very much. Can I vote? Yes, okay. Uh, Mrs. Spoken, based on a general disciplinary conduct that's unacceptable, there are two write-ups in 2022, both were contraband. Both right up dealt with illegal drugs, excessive criminal history, and the need for substance abuse treatment. I deny your request. Uh, Mr. Thomas, I urge you to stay the course. Uh, you're doing well. Stay the course. And I deny it well. And I urge you to reapply as soon as you're eligible. Uh, due to, um, but for the reasons stated by Mr. Roche, my vote is denied. But I encourage you to continue to stay the course and be applied when you're eligible. Mr. Smokey, my vote likewise is to uh, deny. I think you need some strong uh, long term substance abuse treatment. The board indicates that she's going to assist you in trying to get into that. So uh, uh, I hope uh, that you take advantage of that. And perhaps the next time you'll have a different verdict. Today, are your uh, request has been denied. So, good luck to you. Sir. Thank you.
Oh, we get to see y'all again. All right. Okay, we back on. Uh, yes. The committee on parole is called back to order. The time is 105. Our next case is uh, Dwayne Sims. Mr. Sims, would you please give us your full name and DOC number? Dwayne Sims, 89307. Mr. Sims, uh, let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record. Then we're going to conduct a parole interview with you. Uh, once we do your interview, uh, we'll ask the warden for her input. Uh, and then uh, those persons who wish to have input uh, will speak. You have uh, Ms. Christy Sheremy here with the Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, you have uh, an attorney, Mr. Uh, Evan Zizzi, uh, Ms. Uh, Wanda Wilson, your cousin, uh, Marika Sims, your wife, Gloria Jacobs, who is here just to uh, uh, for moral support, and Adrienne Hutchinson, also uh, an attorney who is here. Uh, in opposition is Mr. Randy Meyer with the Jefferson Parish District Attorney's Office. Uh, after we listen to uh, everyone that has input and our hearing is done, you'll have an opportunity to say whatever you'd say you'd like to say to the board. We'll turn it over to your lawyers to close out and then we'll vote. You understand our process? Yes, sir. This is uh, the matter of Dwayne Sims. DOC number 89307, date of birth 12 1961. He's a third felony offender. He has a parole eligibility date of August the 1st of 2021, an adjusted good time date of March the 22nd of 2110, and a full term date of October the 19th of 2110. He is currently serving a 110 year sentence on the, on the charges of armed robbery, and armed robbery after having been adjudicated a habitual offender. Mr. Sims, is that information all correct? Yes, sir. The case has been assigned to Mr. Alvin Roche. Please answer any questions he might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Sims. How are you doing? Okay. Nice seeing you again. Yes, sir. Remember I said on your, your first hearing? Yes, I remember you on my first hearing. Okay. And that first hearing was held on March 16th, 2022, what, about uh, 19 months ago? Is that yes, correct? Sir. And you were denied by a vote of two to one. And the reason the member gave a lack of responsibility for your actions. You remember that? Yes, sir. <laughs> and on June 8th of 2023, you were granted a rehearing by a vote of two to one. And the reason why the member gave for voting against you having a hearing that you have served insufficient time. But two members of that panel voted yes, so you are granted a hearing, and we're here today, okay? Yes, sir. And just for the record, you've served 23 years. Am I, am I correct? Yes, sir. And that's only 21% of the judge's sentence. And most people serve in a neighborhood of 35 to 40, 45 percent of the sentence, but you've only served 21 percent of your sentence. You're 61 years old, and you, you don't have another 80 years to spend, do you? No, sir. And uh, basically, you had no hope of a parole hearing until Act 122 took effect. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So once you reach the age of 45 and you've served 20 years, you were eligible if you had a number of years sentence and your sentence was 110 years. So tell me about the programs that you've completed in the last 19 months. Uh, 100 hour class, victim awareness, thanking for a change, 
inside, outside dad, and uh, ooh, <clears throat> a lot of tree certificates. Well, I need help him out. Okay, he has um, anger management, substance abuse, 100-hour 100, 100 pre-release, victim awareness, thinking for a change, parenting skills, and Malachi dad. All since, all since his last hearing. Uh, no. But from when was his last hearing? I think he only had uh, victim awareness. His, his last hearing was 2022. So Malachi dad. You only had Malachi dads. So, so, so basically, he's only had one good time class since his last year. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Sims? Yes, sir. Did you not understand my question? Yes, sir. So, what have you completed since your last year? Uh, I got another certificate. Volunteer going up man, to the main prison gate where the juvenile was at. I asked for classes, and the only class that you oh classes. They told me that was the only class that I had needed that's the only one classification. Very high dance. So okay, okay, that answers my question. So tell me what your transition plan is. It, yeah. I see where you have an initial plan with the Louisiana Pro Project. Then you can move to a railroad Louisiana and be employed by a family business called Angels. I'm, called, I'm sorry, God Appointed Angels, a home care agency, right? Yes, sir. So tell me about that transition plan. My transition plan. My wife owned the business, and uh, I'll be working on need for her, and uh, doing home help is a companion. According to your wife, you're going to be a co-owner and managing partner. Right. You know, so, you know, it's it's not new to me because the simple reason why I'm doing it here with the guys that one of them got cancer and one of them is blind, and I, I serve my purpose to them, helping them much as I can. So when I do get out, you know, it gives me a, a head start of what I'm going to be dealing with doing home health. Okay. Now, if I only completed one program, so if you had any uh, organizational activity, community service, have you done any, any educational advancements? Well, I was in school. They removed me out of school because my grades is flexible up and down. They're saying that I couldn't comprehend. So, so, you, they, don't, so you don't have a GED? No, I'm on LD level. That's the lowest level. And I've been in school since 2007. Okay. M M Mr. Sims, let me ask you one question. Juan Ambo, is he certified? No, sir. Okay, thank you. So, exactly where is the problem with GED? What subject area do you have a problem with? Well, with reading, uh, English. And, uh, you know, it's complicated because education now is more advanced now. And I can read something, but I can't hold on to it. Okay, right. Okay, all right. Uh, but I'm. Have you had any disciplinary write-ups since your I, last? I had one that was in uh, 19, 2019. Mr. Sims, listen to my questions. Listen to my questions. Have you had any write-ups since your last hearing? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. The last write-up you had was four years ago. Yes, sir. Okay. That's the same write-up you had at the last hearing. Yes, sir. 
you still have opposition from the Jefferson Parish legal community. The judge in Jefferson Parish is opposed. The DA's office is opposed. And Mr. Randy Meyer, assistant DA from Jefferson Parish, will make a presentation a little later on. And the law enforcement is very uh, adamantly opposed to any clemency. We have multiple letters of support from your family, your friends. Your wife wrote an excellent letter telling us about your uh, incorporated business and uh, other relatives, friends, community, clergy, and some of the supervisors at Louisiana State Penitentiary also wrote letters of support. So tell me why this panel should vote to release you after serving only 21% of your sentence. Well, sir, I've been rehabilitated and I know what I had done, I regret it from the bottom of my heart. And if I can go back and change what I've done, I would do it in a heartbeat. And the program helped me. It helped me to be able to think, to be able to walk away from unnecessary problems that I may bring about on myself. And if I be released, I would like to go back out into society with a job to pay taxes, to be a, a known citizen, to give back to the community, you know. But I didn't change a lot. I'm not the same person. I don't have that state of mind of committing any more wrongdoing. This time had broke me. It broke me. And you know, I'm not just saying it just to be saying it. It took a lot out of me. And now I'm not in denial no more. I can stand up here in front of the board and tell them what really happened with my situation, with that crime. So, Mr. Sims, you were 37 years old when you committed this crime, right? Yes, sir. How does a man, 37 years old, jump out of a car and take a leap off the West Bank Expressway, resulting in breaking his leg? Well, sir, I wasn't thinking at all. I was acting off impulse without thinking. Didn't think about when I lame. If I would kill myself or survive, I just took a chance without even thinking. And like I say, I pay, I'm willing, I paid the price for the crime that I had done. And I'm sorry, my remorse go out to the victim. And I would never in my life again hurt anybody or do any other type of crime. I know if I come back to jail, I know I'm not going to live to see, you know, many more years. So the only thing I'm asking the board to take it a need for consideration and give me an opportunity to prove myself that I'm worth going back into society. You yes. said I'm going to make you aware that one of those tellers, a victim of the bank robbery, had to leave the state of Louisiana within a month of her being robbed. She was so traumatized that she's in Arizona now. Mm -hmm. as one teller who quit her job. Another teller tells a story about everywhere she goes, she's looking behind her back. She still feels the effect of your two brothers going in and robbing that bank. It's a lifelong Effect and impact on those victims who cannot live a normal life simply because three brothers decided that one day they were going to go into a bank and rob the bank. And that story about your brother calling you at your mother's house to pick up a prescription and you had no idea what was going on, is ludicrous. Why would you park in the back of a drugstore with both doors open with the motor running? 
Well, I was the getaway driver of the bank robbery, and I'm just as much as guilty as them. Even though I didn't go in the bank, I'm sitting behind the wheel of the car. And, and when you they it, and you knew exactly what was happening. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I have no further questions. Uh, I'll make my decision at a later date. Thank you. Uh, now we'll hear from uh, Ms. Jeremy with the Parole Project. Yes, sir. Mr. Jeremy, representing Louisiana Parole Project. Um, if uh, Mr. Sims is granted today, uh, he will um, come and do our phase one programming. Uh, it's understood that after programming and receiving all services provided by the Louisiana Parole Project, Mr. Sims will reside uh, with his wife in Morero and maintain a stable employment with their, um, their business uh, that she owns. I uh, want to make sure that I properly, uh, it God's appointed angels and, um, and maintain his life uh, with his family. And of course we will be providing case management um, for the first 12 months of uh, Mr. Sims is released if, if granted today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Juan Ambo. Yes, sir. I forgot to ask for your input. Would you like to make any remarks or observations? Uh, yes, I just want to make one uh, remark on behalf of Mr. Sims. And just to let you know that he has uh, tried multiple times to obtain his uh, GED high set and to no avail that the education coordinator even wrote in his file that he he granted him a waiver of his academic requirement due to his um, unable to obtain it due, due to the low level of performance. So he he, he has okay. a learn he has a learning disability. Besides that, is he a good offender? I have, I have, since I've been at Angola, I have had no problem out of Mr. Sims at all. Thank you. Well, Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman. Uh, now we're here from Ms. Wanda Wilson. Yes. Ms. Wilson? Yes. Yeah. Right. You can stay right there. They can hear you. Okay. Uh, you I'm just introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like us to know. Okay. Uh, I've known him all my life, and the situation with the circumstances that he got caught up into, uh, I felt like he's remorse from what, what happened, and I'm, I'm quite sure he's shown me where he's sorry for what he did. And, and in most of the situation, I believe he can come back into the community to help improve himself and show the community that he's not planning on returning back. And I'm quite sure of that. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson. Uh, Ms. Marika Sims? Yes. Uh, I want to say I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that my husband is remorseful for his action. He's regretful. And I know that he's completely rehabilitated. I look forward to him. I pray and ask that God touch your hearts to open the doors for him so that he can come and work in our business and reside back at our home to where we can begin our life. I know he won't get into any more trouble. God put God ahead of everything. He's gonna continue to strive to be a better person. He's gonna be a beacon in the community. I have confidence in my husband and like I said, I know that he's rehabilitated. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now we'll hear from uh, Mr. Randy Meyer. Good afternoon, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA Jefferson Parish. And uh, we remain opposed to Mr. Sims' request. We'll say I'm glad to hear that um, he's admitted to his participation in the crime for the first time. Uh, you know, I opposed him strongly at the pardon board because he was not honest with the board. Um, and uh, he, he continued to be not honest with the board with his, with his participation until today. First time I've heard that. I'm glad to hear that. I think that goes a long way to, to 
uh, him being able to be rehabilitated. Um, I'm concerned in 2019 was his last disciplinary report. That was the contraband. Not sure what that contraband was, um, but that is concerning to me. And the lack of programming, particularly when we look at his extensive criminal record, that in included three weapons offenses. And um, he had a prior armed robbery, and then this was, was four counts of armed robbery. So a total of five armed robberies. Uh, the only program since the last hearing was Malachi Dads. Uh, I truly think uh, additional programming is is uh, needed for him to um, to really be fully rehabilitated in order to get out and remain out. Thanks. Thank you, um, Mr. Sims. Is there anything you'd like to say before we turn it over to your attorney? Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I'm sorry that I had to put the victim through what they went through behind my stupid mistake that I made being selfish, you know, and I regret it. I regret it. Not only the victim, I regret it hurting my family, hurting my community, everybody that was surrounding itself around me. And if I get an opportunity, like I say, if I get an opportunity to go back into society, um, you never will see my face again. I just want to go out there and do positive things for the community and give back what I had stole from you. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Zizzi, if you'll introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like us to hear. Uh, good afternoon to the committee. Uh, my name is Evan Zizai. I am a um, licensed attorney in Thibodeau, Louisiana. I also represented Mr. Sims at his previous hearing on March 16th of 2022, and I'm now continuing that representation to his rehearing today. Um, I'd like to point out the programming in, in particular. Mr. Sims started taking classes at Angola before he ever even knew that he was going to be able to you know, apply for parole. He completed anger management in 2006, living in balance one and two in 2011, leadership disciples in 2008. He completed parenting skills in 2009. I mean, he's been trying to improve himself regardless of his possible release in the future. Um, moreover, you look at the certificates of appreciation that he has received. He's got, he got a certificate of appreciation in 2022 based off of his service, selflessness, and humility during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then even this year, February 7th of 2023, he received a certificate of, of appreciation for cleaning and preparing the reception center at Louisiana State Penitentiary. And while he has had write-ups, nearly all of them have occurred between the years 2002 and 2006, and the only recent one was in 2019. And while he hasn't had significant programming within the last year, the last parole hearing he had was he was denied. And the basis of that was his GED, the two out of three votes. So ever since that hearing, he has been determined to try and obtain that GED. He took the, the TAB test on June 2022, November 2022. February 2023 and May 2023. And then eventually in June, he was dropped from the class because he could not obtain the, the score. So he had he was determined based off of the previous hearing to go and obtain that GED and do whatever it took to, you know, to, to please the board and show that he was willing to work and was determined to improve himself. And I guess lastly, he's taken the TABE test 36 times. So it's not from a lack of trying. Um, I think based off of the way that he speaks, the way that, that, that he has talked to the board and been honest about his life circumstances, how he's changed. Um, you know, on behalf of Mr. Sims, I humbly ask that, that this honorable committee grant his request for parole with any conditions necessary to guarantee his release. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zizai. We appreciate your comments. Pam, uh, ready to Yes. Roche. Mr. Sims. Yes, I'm, very, I'm very proud of you. You took your first step towards full 
rehabilitation. You took responsibility for what you did. And you did it in public. And that's your first step. I voted for you last time. I'm going to vote for you this time. And we'll tell you why. Positive remarks for one Ambo, your age, age of defender, you're 61 years old. You don't have another 80 years. <clears throat> um, you have an excellent transition plan. You will leave one ward and go to the other one. And she's going to keep it straight. <laughs> your class A trustee. You've been a class A trustee for 10 or 12 years. You have a good institutional record. You have good family support and the community service that you rendered to fellow inmates and staff is outstanding. I grant your early release. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So uh, Mr. Stem, uh, you can't see it from here, but from my vantage point, you have three ladies standing behind you, and I, I believe that uh, if you... Man, man, uh, they look pretty determined. That's all I'm saying. Uh, and they love you. They're here because yeah. they, they know right from wrong and they're going to do their part. You just got to do your part. So my vote is to grant as well for the reasons already been stated on the record by Mr. Roche. And I just concur with any uh, special conditions imposed by Mr. Roche. Best wishes to you, sir, and you ladies. Thank you. Your Thank job you. just begins. Mr. Uh, Sims, uh, you have two votes to grant. My vote likewise is to grant. Uh, uh, I, I don't know that Mr. Roche stated any conditions, but okay. uh, I assume he's going to want a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, follow all recommendations of your uh, parole officer uh, and uh, all of the recommendations of the Louisiana Parole Project. Any other conditions, Mr. Um, no. Good luck to you. Thank you all so much.
Committee on Parole is called back to order. The time is 1.38. Our next case is Mr. Albert Waddles. Mr. Waddles, would you give us your full name and DOC number, please? Albert Waddles, 104240. Thank you, Mr. Waddles. Uh, Mr. Waddles, let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record. Then we're going to conduct a parole interview with you. We'll then ask Ward Nambo if he has any input, uh, and we'll listen to what she has to say. Uh, and those persons who wish to speak on your behalf will have an opportunity to speak. Uh, you do have several people uh, both there as well as it looks like maybe on Zoom who are supporting you but don't wish to speak. And that's uh, Quincy Hood, your nephew, Rosemary Hood, your sister, uh, Patricia Parker, and Gerald Parker. Uh, also uh, on Zoom is Miss Christy Sheremy. Uh, there with you is your attorney, Mr. Robert Lancaster, as well as Megan Carlson, who is a law student working with Mr. Lancaster. Uh, once we hear from all of those persons, uh, you'll have an opportunity to say whatever you'd like to say to the board, and then your lawyers will close out and then we'll vote. Do you understand our process? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, this, yes, is sir. The, this is the matter of Albert Waddles, DOC number 104240. Uh, date of birth, September the 30th of 1962. Mr. Waddles has a parole eligibility date of June the 7th of 2023, an adjusted good time date of March the 27th of 2031. Uh, he was originally sentenced on a second degree murder charge and an armed robbery charge to life imprisonment uh, on uh, June the 7th of 2023. Uh, his sentence was commuted by Governor uh, Edwards to 99 years. Uh, is that pretty accurate, Mr. Waddles? Yes, sir. Mr. Waddles, your case has been assigned to me, so uh, I will begin uh, discussing this matter with you. Mr. Waddles, how old are you, sir? 61. And how long have you been in prison on these charges? I've been in Angola for 39 years. I've been incarcerated 41. 41 all together. Is that right? Yes sir. yes, sir. So so you were 20 years old when this happened? I was 19. 19. Okay. Tell me, let's talk a little bit about Ap Ap Albert Waddles at 19 years old. Uh, how far had you gone in school? I went to the 10th grade in school. Okay. Uh, and what were you doing at the time? Were you working? Uh, what were you doing at 19 years old? I was in between jobs. At 19 okay. years old, I was working for Midwest Farms. Then I got laid off, and then I started doing some crazy stuff when I was 19. Well, uh, where, who were you living with? Where were you living? I was living with Miss Betty Leary at the time in Moortown in Streetport, Louisiana. Now, you talked about doing some crazy things. Were drugs and alcohol involved at all? No, not drugs. I didn't do no drugs. I drank, uh -huh. the, I drank the beer. Yes, I did. Did you drink a lot? Not, no, sir. I didn't drink a lot. So alcohol wasn't an issue? Well, I wouldn't say it was an issue, but you know, when you drink one drink, you have the desire to drink, you can always become an alcoholic. So I'm not going to rule that out. So tell me what you're talking about when you say you did a lot of crazy things. Talk to me about the crazy things you did. Well, I did some running around with some guys that I shouldn't have been running around with. We did some little petty burglaries and stuff like that. Stole some stuff out of the store, like shoplifting, stuff like that. So tell me about these robberies, these armed robberies, the the uh, the Seven Eleven, and tell me what happened. Well, I walked in there at Seven Eleven, and I pulled a pistol and demanded money, and I ended up shooting this clerk, which I didn't want to. But other than that. There's nothing too much to say, Mister. Now, it, it, the, the 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 record suggests that you also admitted to robbing the same store. Uh, oh, yes, I did previously. Okay, tell me yeah. about that. Tell me about that. First one. Yeah. Okay. First one. I came to the Seven Eleven one night on a bicycle, and I robbed the Seven Eleven. And that time, there I walked in, demanded the money. Took the guy wallet and I got away with that one. And so 
when I come back to the second robbery, I needed some money. And I went back to the same 7-Eleven and I robbed the guy. And that's when I ended up shooting the guy. So you've been in prison for 41 years. Uh, tell me what, what you think about uh, Albert Waddles at 19 years old. I think Albert Waddles was a stupid kid at 19 years old that caused a lot of harm to people. And since I've been here, that I grow a lot and through the program that I've taken, it taught me a lot about myself. What what programs that you've taken do you believe or feel that help you the most? I most identify with the victim awareness because it showed me that empathy, and I didn't know what that was. And I think about my sister, my nephew, and if I put myself in their position, in the victim position, I would know how I feel. You had, uh, you've had 73 write-ups in the past. Your last one was in 2017. What was that for? Me and my girlfriend was at a banquet and we went into the weight room of the training academy to have sex. And when we went through the door, it didn't feel right. And we looked at each other and just said, no, this can't work. So we turned around and on our way out, coming out the door, the security officer seen us and that's when he locked me up. Tell me about where where will you go? What will you do if you're released? I know the Louisiana Pro Project is here, and, and I know that you're going to be going there. But tell me what, what your plans are when you get out. I want to go with my sister. My sister has a room for me in Shreveport, and my nephew has a job for me. The best working with his media company. I would be putting up security cameras and helping with speakers and anything else you need me to do. Tell me the trades that you've learned while you've been in prison. At presently, I work for 914 Warehouse. I learned how to do plumbing, I do maintenance, and I fix little minor things on the 18 wheelers at transportation, as well as keeping fuel, change the oil. And I do kind of like electrical work. I'm learning more about that. Uh uh, your lawyer has filed a, a uh, an excellent brief on your behalf, uh, showing uh, all of the things that you've done, your vocational work, your educational work, and your personal development. Uh, you, you've taken Thinking for a Change, 100 hours of pre-release, anger management. Uh, did you have an anger issue? Do you think that was a problem? When I, first, when I first came to prison, yes, I did have an anger issue because I felt like I was blaming everybody else for my mistake. And I had to find a way to try to get rid of that. So I, the anger management came up and came available to us. That's when I took the class and I learned from that class how to try to keep my anger in check and how to try to see anybody else that's feeling like that, how I can curb their anger. Warden, what can you tell us about uh... Mr. Waters. Well, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Waddles. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So uh, I can tell you that he's a minimum A trustee and he do work for prison enterprise and the transportation um, at the warehouse. His last report was in 2017. He has taken substance abuse, taken for a change, victim awareness, 100 hour uh, pre release, anger management, Malachi Dad, and he also has his GED that he obtained in 1991. Um, I have had no problem with uh, Mr. Waddles, uh, the ladies at Prison Enterprise and the gentleman at Prison Enterprise, uh, commend him on his excellent work that he does there in helping them. Um, so uh, I do think that he will be a successful citizen if y'all was to uh, grant him this uh, pardon parole. Thank you very much, Ward. We appreciate your comments. Uh, let's hear from uh, your supporters, uh, Ms. Uh, Sharmi. Representing uh, Christian Shammer, representing the Louisiana Parole Project. Um, just so the, it's noted to the board, um, if Mr. Waddles is granted today, 
Uh, we are solely committed to uh, providing all uh, reentry programming. He will be housed uh, with us uh, short term. The plan is after completion of our program, he will be residing uh, with his relative in the Shreveport area. We will be committed, of course, to uh, at least the, the next 12 months of case management and providing continued services to Mr. Waddles as needed. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Waddles, is there anything you'd like to say before I turn it over to your lawyers? I'd just like to ask the board to me. Give me a moment. <laughs> Take your time, sir. Let me just say thank y'all for having me here today. And I know I'm not the same 19 year old person. I'm just asking for a second chance. That's all. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Carlson? Yes, hi. Good afternoon. Um, I first off want to thank the board for allowing me to speak on Albert's behalf today. Um, I think throughout this hearing, we have seen um, some clear reasons why Albert is ready for re release. Um, including his work and um, his his maintenance work, obtaining his GED, all of his um, completions of his self de uh, self development courses, um, as well as his reentry plan. Um, I think there are just a few things I wanted to mention on his be on his behalf that um, were not mentioned. Um, the first off being that he did obtain his paralegal cert cert certificate and he has used this as well as um after he obtained his GE his GED he became an unofficial tutor for a lot of inmates in the prison um and and I think this is really indicative of his of his character as we've seen he's very he's very genuine re remorseful and um he does he he not only works on himself he also helps others and he does not do this for the accolades. He does not do this for a for any type of certificate. He 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 does it because he knows um truly it is what is good. So um for those reasons, um we res we res sorry, we respectfully ask that Albert be uh, granted parole with any conditions that um you see see fit. Thank you very much, Ms. Carlson. We appreciate your comments. Panel ready to vote? Yes. Mr. Waddles. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, it was uh, a pleasure talking with you. Uh, I enjoyed the interview with you. You're a very sincere uh, man. And uh, it's uh, very obvious to me uh, that uh, you have matured a lot from that 19-year-old uh, boy who committed this crime. Comments by our Ward Dambo uh, are, are tremendous. Very good work that you've done. The lawyer has pointed out all of the good uh, community service work you performed for the people while they're been in prison. Uh, I did notice that you had studied paralegals, and I did point it out, and I'm glad that you did. Uh, you have given back to your community. You've got an excellent transition plan with the Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, you've been in prison for 41 years. Uh, my vote would be to grant today to the Louisiana Parole Project, follow all of their recommendations, and then when you're done, to follow all of your recommendations with your parole officer. So uh, I hope you go back to Shreveport, uh, and I hope uh, you uh, enjoy your life. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Just one vote. Mr. Roche? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wiles, how are yes, you doing? How are you doing? I see you again. Sir. Mr. Waddles, my vote is exactly the same for the same reasons. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Ms. Wallace. Uh, Mr. Waddles, uh, you did a great harm. You healed and you've been helping others. And I want, and, and there's nothing else we can ask. I commend you for that. I, my vote is the same for the same reasons with the added condition that six months after release in the strip, where well, when you get to Shreveport, let's put it like that, whenever you relocate to Shreveport, uh, begin some community service effort, uh, at least eight hours, at least eight hours a month. Give back to the community with the elderly, with 
Just whatever. You got so many talents and skills, you can decide. And in that eight hours, your yes, preparations sir. for your that counts as well. So best wishes to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fox. Uh, Mr. Waddles, Thank you. Uh, parole has been granted uh, with uh, the conditions. You go to the Louisiana Parole Project, finish that uh, program, and then follow whatever their instructions are. Listen to your parole officer and do uh, eight hours of community service work once you relocate to Shreveport. So good luck to you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome.
Yeah. I was like 21, 22. Twenty-seven. What am I doing? Yeah. Committee <laughs> on parole is called back to order. The time is two o'clock. Our next case is Mr. Gilbert Williams. Mr. Williams, would you please uh, introduce yourself and give us your DOC number? My name is Gilbert Williams. My number is nine five nine one four. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Uh, uh, let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record, and then we're going to do a parole interview with you. We'll ask the warden to give us some comments on you, uh, and then we'll uh, listen to those people who wish to have some input. Uh, you have a couple of people here. Uh, your fiance, uh, Sanji uh, Sparks, uh, doesn't wish to speak, but is here for support. Uh, your nephew, Tori Collins, uh, is going to be on Zoom, and he wishes to speak. Uh, Ms. Sheremy, which Ms. Christy Sheremy with the Louisiana Parole Project is here and will be speaking. Mr. Robert Lancaster is your attorney, and he has a law student with you, Mr. Rory Blackmore, who will be uh, representing you today. Uh, once we hear from all of these people, uh, you'll have an opportunity to say whatever you'd like to say. Uh, your lawyers will close out before the board, and then we'll vote. You understand how our process works? Yes, sir. Okay. This is a matter of Gilbert. C. Williams, DOC number 95914, date of birth February the 19th of 1953. He's first class felony offender. He has a parole eligibility date of June the 7th of 2023, an adjusted good time date of August 19th of 2028, and a full term date of February 14th of 2079. He is currently serving uh, a uh, he was sentenced originally for second degree murder to life, and his sentence was commuted uh, and signed on 6 7 of 2023 to make him immediately parole eligible. Uh, does that sound about right, Mr. Williams? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Williams, your case has been assigned to Ms. Pearl Wise. She will begin our process of interviewing you. Would you please answer any questions she might have? Yes, sir. Okay. Good, afternoon. good afternoon, Mr. Williams. How are you doing? I'm good. And you? I'm good. Thank you for asking. I'm good. You're the one we've been waiting on all day. You're the last one of the day. So we're excited. That's why we're glad yes, to see you. Uh, tell us, uh, how old are you today, sir? 70. And how long you been in jail on this charge? 43 years. 43 years. Uh, and, and, and it's already been stated, uh, you've been, you know, you've been granted a clemency. Um, tell us a little bit about your job. Just want to put that on the record. What was your job at, at, at Louisiana, where you at, at Angola? What was your job? I drive the record truck. I go around helping all the employees fix tires, help them get their vehicles started. If they get stranded or something, for them to go home. Yeah, you've been doing that for the last 17 years, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Are you still doing it at 70? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I just want to be sure. Okay, that's good to hear. Uh, Ms. Wise, 70 is young. Yes, sir. I'm not. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, there was some indication in the, in the record that your mother recently passed. Is, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry for your loss. What, May of 2022? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry for your loss. My condolences to you, sir. Thank you. She uh, and how old was she? She was 92. Oh, okay. That's great. That's great. So you got longevity. You you got good genes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> got good genes. Uh, so tell us what your plans are if you're successful today. I would like, really go to parole project. Yes, sir. And then from from there, I go home to New Orleans with my fiance. Give me a job and go from there. Okay, good, good. I just want to state that for the record. That's uh, I'm gonna state it out loud for the record. And the record shows that you've been a a, a trustee trustee since 1997. Is that correct? Yes, um, uh, you, your last write up was in 2016, right? Yes, ma'am. Um. Let me see what else I want. I just kind of want to say some things for the record. Um, and how much education do you have? Six. 
sir? Sixth grade. Sixth grade. Okay. Sixth grade education. And you have 510 days of programming. So you've been busy. You've been learning. Yes, ma'am. I'm showing 510 days of programming. That's right. Um, and that's all I had to ask you. Warden, uh, what you want us to know about this, this young man, Mr. Williams? I can tell you that Mr. William is a minimum A trustee and he works in uh, AS&R shop. Uh, Mr. William is a very, very um, trusted individual around here as he does drive motor vehicles and uh, he's trusted to go into the V-Line community where we have employees living to fix uh, their cars, their tires or whatever that he needs to do or just tow them you know, to the shop. So, um, I think that, you know, the years that Mr. William has served here has been um, some great years and he has done a lot of things. And I think that he deserves the right now to be free and go home and continue doing the things that he was doing here in the, in the real world. And I do believe he will be a successful citizen and would not return. That's it. Thank you, Warden. That's all I had, Chair. Thank you very much, Warden. Yes. Uh, now we're here from uh, your nephew, Mr. Tory Collins. Mr. Collins. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Okay. Yes. Hi, okay. Um. So, um, my uncle Gilbert Williams has been in my life since I was ten years old. He has been a great role model to me and mentor. Um, growing up without a father figure in New Orleans at the time was really rough on my mom raising seven kids by herself. And he kept me on a positive path and just having talks to me about doing the right things and how to become successful. I graduated from high school. I got a football scholarship at LSU, played at LSU, um, went to the pros. And he just was a mentor to me to keep me away from the negative things and the poverty I was dealing with in New Orleans and kept me on a straight path to keep me out of prison and um, doing things that could have led to me going to prison but have changed my, my mindset, you know, um, for the best to help the youth, to help the kids to go around, to talk to the kids at school and try to help a lot of kids that's dealing with, you know, not having a father figure and not able to um, really have someone to look up to as a great role model. And my uncle uh, Gilbert Williams has been at, has been a, a second father figure to me in my life and has really helped me through my life and becoming a man I am today, very successful. I have my family and be able to reach back out to the kids today that need strong role models like us in their life. And his fiance, um, Sandra Spokes, has been in my, my life as a second mom to my real mom, uh, Deborah Collins, um, helping me understand the ways and what goes on in life. And Sandra Spokes, my mom, and Gilbert has really been there for me. And um, I hope to see him at home. We miss him. He had my support. I'm going to be there, continue to be there for him and have him continue to help me grow the young minds today, the kids that need us in this world today, in this generation, to keep them from going to prison, selling drugs, and doing things that could keep them away from their family because they don't understand right now at the age that they're living that they need strong role models like us and Mr. Williams to help us through life. Thank you very much, Mr. Collins. Uh, Ms. Jeremy? We're very hopeful with the Louisiana Pearl Project. We're hopeful that um, Mr. Williams is granted today. And uh, with a successful grant, uh, we will provide all services uh, to Mr. Williams. He will be, in fact, a short-term client with us, but that won't stop. We will continue case management with him uh, throughout his first 12 months of, of being home. And... Um, there will be somebody appointed to him to make sure that he maintains uh, those uh, whatever challenges that he may have. We'll we'll make sure that we we help him through that. And I would like to end by requoting what my executive director director mentioned earlier: "Once a client of Louisiana Parole Project, always a client." Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sherman. Uh, Mr. Williams, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before we turn it over to Mr. Blackmore? Yes, sir. I would like to first of all, I would like to thank the board. I appreciate having y'all having me here to listen at my matters and everything. Uh, I appreciate it if you know you give me a be able to give me a chance to return back to society. I wouldn't be no kind of threat to nobody in society or nobody else. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Blackmore. Yes, Mr. Marabella. 
I would just say that everything that I was going to say on Mr. Williams' path has been revealed through him and y'all actions. I would just wrap it up by saying that he will be greatly missed at LSP for his contribu contributions and that we, we pray for he receives parole with any conditions that the committee sees fit. Thank y'all. Thank you very Thank you, much. Sir. Good job. Good job. Panel ready to vote? Yes. All right. Uh, uh, Mr. Williams, uh, my vote is to grant uh, because of your low Tiger score. Uh, I'm going to put it out there, your young age and the, uh, <laughs> and the time served uh, and your excellent transition plan. Um, and I, as a special condition with Loose Down Parole Project, I do want you to follow their 12-month case management. Stay in contact with them. And I'd like to see you engage in uh, marital counseling. And perhaps the parole project can do the marital counseling. But that's going to be a, you got a lot to do. You got a lot to do. So, and even if she don't want to go to marital counseling, you can go uh, and just kind of stay plugged in with that for a period of time that the counselor think is necessary. Our best wishes to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Williams. Yes, sir. My vote is the same. The same reasons. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Williams, uh, before I address you, I'd like to address Mr. Blackmore. Mr. Blackmore, uh, you're going to be a great lawyer. A uh, good lawyer knows when they're ahead and, and uh, when <laughs> things off. Okay, so you did a great job. Yeah. Thank uh, you, Mr. Marabella. Mr. Williams, uh, I echo everything that uh, the, the board has said. Uh, I think uh, Warden Ambo summed it up. Uh, uh, and I think Mr. Blackmore said it, uh, you're going to be missed there. And, uh, you know, sad for them, but good for you. And uh, my vote likewise is the same. Uh, grant your parole to the Louisiana Parole Project. And follow whatever recommendations they make. Uh, and, uh, of course, follow all the rules of your uh, parole. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, sir. I think we're done. Warden Ambo, thank you so much for uh, all your work today. Mr. Lancaster, good seeing you. Uh, Thank you so much. Y'all have a good evening. Well, well. All right. All right. Right here. Yeah. Look, here we go. Look, he took a, he took a, uh,